بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم وی بگن ٹو ڈیز پروگرام ود دا کرات دا ریسٹیشن فرام دی ہولی قرآن بائی بردر اشرف محمدی السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم حامیم تنزیل الكتاب من اللہ العزیز الحکیم ان فی السماوات والارض رأی وفی خلق کم و میا بت آیا تل The translation Surah Sajda chapter 32 verses 1 to 3 I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the accursed in the name of Allah most gracious most merciful Alif Lam Meem this is the revelation of the book in which there is no doubt from the Lord of the world or do they say he has forged it nay it is the truth from your Lord that you may admonish a people to whom no warner has come before you in order that they may receive guidance Surah Jathia, chapter 45 verses 1 to 6 in the name of Allah most gracious most merciful Hameem the revelation of the book is from Allah the exalted in power full of wisdom verily in the heavens and the earth are signs for those who believe 
and in the creation of yourselves and the fact that animals are scattered through the earth are signs for those of assured faith and in the alternation of night and day and the fact that Allah sends down sustenance from the sky and revives therewith the earth after its death and in the change of wind are signs for those that are wise. Such are the signs of Allah which we rehearse to you in truth. Then in what exposition will they believe after rejecting Allah and his signs? Verily, Allah speaks the truth. Our chief guest for the day, Mr. Rafiq Dada, the distinguished guests of honor, respected elders, our special guests who have come from other cities of India today, as well as those who have come from abroad, brothers and sisters. I, Dr. Muhammad Naik, welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum. May peace be on you. I am your host and coordinator for today's program organized by the Islamic Research Foundation. The Islamic Research Foundation, a registered public trust, was established in February 1991 and has been striving since then for the proper presentation, understanding and clarification of Islam as well as removing misconceptions about Islam amongst Muslims as well as non-Muslims. Along with the real faith, reason, logic and modern scientific understanding form the basis of all our presentations and discussions on Islam. The IRF has more than 1600 video cassette titles collection on Islam available on free hire. It also has more than 4500 audio cassette titles on Islam. We have more than 55 IRF publications in English on Islam which are distributed free on request. MashaAllah, we have lately been receiving excellent response from the cable television operators in Bombay and the viewers for our video cassettes. In addition, the IRF also has many ongoing charitable, educational and other aid programs. You may wonder, why have a talk on, is the Quran God's word? Today, as you would know, Islam in its resurgence continues to shape events around the globe having contemporary relevance. Its main constitutional book of guidance is the Holy Quran. It is the basic unifying and transformational source for Muslims. And lately, the Quran has been more subjected to mischievous misquotations, criticisms based on half-truths and out-of-context remarks, as well as illogical and unscientific false allegations by ill-informed or biased persons in the West as well as in India. Therefore, the Islamic Research Foundation has thought it fit to hold this public talk today on Is the Quran God's Word by Dr. Zakir Naik? Our objective is to critically analyze the topic as well as keep it open to question in public. At the end, we leave it to you, O oh members of the audience, to judge right from wrong. Our chief guest for today, Mr. Rafiq Dada, is an eminent authority on constitutional law and a leading senior advocate in India. In 1966, he stood second in the LLM 
exams of the University of Bombay. He was designated a senior advocate in 1987. He regularly appears in cases in the High Court and the Supreme Court of India. A thorough gentleman with dynamic knowledge of contemporary human affairs and motivations, Mr. Dada is the Vice President of the Bombay Bar Association. In November 1994, the Government of India has honoured him with an appointment as the Additional Solicitor General of India. May I present to the August audience present here, Mr. Rafiq Dada. Assalamu alaikum. Dr. Muhammad Naik, the speaker of the day, Dr. Zakir Naik, distinguished members of the audience, ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you in all humility, for I am but very small in this great hall of knowledge. But small as I am, I am reminded of that little story of a fisherman who went when early morning before the sun came out. When he cast his net, he found a load. And when he checked it up in the darkness, he found that there were little pieces of stone. So he lamented his faith and he started throwing stone after stone into the water. But when he was about to cast the last few stones, the sun came out in all his glory and suddenly he saw that what he was throwing away into the sea was not a stone but was a precious pearl. Therefore, in the darkness of ignorance, he was casting away pearls, thinking that it was stone. It was only in the light that he ultimately saw reality. And then he lamented his faith that all the darkness which had gone by in the previous time had been wasted and he had given away something so precious. As far as the world of Muslims is concerned, the light shone bright 1400 years back when the Holy Quran was revealed to the world. It is an article of faith with every Muslim that the Holy Quran is the word of God. There is no debate possible on the subject. This is the article, it is axiomatic, it is the article of faith for every Muslim. Not only is this an article of faith, but it is the belief of Muslims that religion has been perfected with the Holy Quran. And in the Holy Quran it has been mentioned that this religion will be protected and preserved by the Almighty. In fact, such is the miracle of the Holy Quran that right from the time of the Holy Prophet, hundreds and thousands and now millions and maybe crores of people have committed it to memory, so that not only is it inscribed in beautiful paper, but it is enshrined in the hearts and minds of men, so that it can never ever be erased, and it always remains in its authentic purity. It is a matter of pleasure and pride for me, and as I have said in all humility, that you have considered me fit to stand before you and say all this. I say that it is necessary to meet and talk about all this because we are living at a time which the scientists have called the age of calculators and Philistines. Science has been used to denigrate religion and therefore it is necessary to reiterate some of the verses of the Holy Quran which point out to the scientific base which we, one finds in it. Dr. Maurice Bukel is from the French Academy of Science. 
On 14th of June 1978, he addressed a big gathering in London. His subject was the Holy Quran in modern science. He referred to various verses from the Holy Quran and he established with great conviction that what was mentioned 1400 years back has now been found by science. For instance, he mentioned that the Holy Quran mentioned the fact that God Almighty, Allah Almighty had created the day and the night, the sun and the moon, each moving in its own orbit with its own motion. This was revealed at a time when the major part of the world, or perhaps all the world, believed that the world was flat and anyone who had the courage to talk about anything to the contrary was either slaughtered or executed or was told that he was a heretic. Likewise, it has been mentioned that with the power of Allah, if human beings can penetrate the heavens and the earth, they shall do it. This was also mentioned at a time when the world perhaps did not even know a bullock cart. And the question of going into the heaven was nothing but a distant dream. All this was revealed 1400 years back and Dr. Maurice Bukel pointed this out in the seminar in London. It is difficult to comprehend the great subject that is going to be talked about today. But we have a very distinguished speaker, Dr. Zakir Naik. Most people are familiar with his speech and with his great knowledge. Dr. Zakir Naik, as you all know, in a short span of 30 years, has delivered innumerable discourses on various religious subjects. He has spoken to audiences, many and hundreds of audiences in the country, and also audiences abroad, like in South Africa. He has visited various parts of the world, the UK, the USA, Germany, France, Switzerland, and various other parts of the Middle East and Far East. In fact, one of the great thinkers of recent times, Dr. Ahmed Didat, with great pleasure called Dr. Naik, Didat Plus. So we have Didat Plus before us and we have this vast subject. I pray to the Almighty that we have the strength, we have the humility and that he may shower us with his blessings and his glory. Thank you very much. Uh, for the seating committee and the reception committee, I would kindly request you to adjust the younger people on the stage so we could uh, be more respectful for the elders and provide them seats. We know it is a little congested, a little difficult, but if we can cooperate, we can make a very good program going. Now we have the main talk of the day is the Quran, God's Word by Dr. Zakir Naik. Auzu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Afalai tadabbaroon al-Quran, walau kana min indi gari Allah, wa wajadu fi ikhtilafan kafira. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تنوريهم آياتنا في الآفاق وفي أنفسهم حتى يتبين لهم أنه الحق أولم يكفي بربك أنه على كل شيء شهيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويصر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفكه قولي Respected guest of honor, Mr. Rafiq Dada, the distinguished guest of honor, the learned scholars, the respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace, blessings, and mercy of Almighty Allah be on all of you. The topic of this morning's talk is 
is the Quran God's word. Many people have a misconception that Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, was the founder of the religion of Islam. In fact, Islam is in existence since man first set foot on the earth. God Almighty has sent several revelations and messengers to this earth. All the previous prophets sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were meant only for their people and their nation. And the complete message was meant for a particular time period. That's the reason. That's the miracle they performed, like the parting of the sea, like raising the dead to your life, convinced the people of that time, but cannot be examined and verified by us today. Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, was the last and final messenger of God Almighty sent to the whole of humanity and his message is meant till eternity. The Quran mentions in Surah Al-Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 110, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ alamin That we have said not thee, but as a mercy to the whole humankind, as a mercy to all the world. Since Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, was the last and final messenger, and his message was everlasting, that's the reason the miracle given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should also be everlasting and examinable by us at all the time. Though Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, performed several miracles which are mentioned in the hadith, that is the traditions, he never emphasized them. Though we Muslims believe in all these miracles, we only boast of the ultimate miracle given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the Holy Quran. Al-Quran is the miracle of all time. It proved itself to be a miracle 1400 years ago. It can be reconfirmed today and forever. In short, it's the miracle of miracles. Probably the only point common amongst the people, whether they be Muslims or non-Muslims, is that the Quran was recited the first time by a man born in the city of Mecca in Arabia in the 6th century by the name Muhammad may peace be upon him regarding the source of the Holy Quran there can be basically three different assumptions the first is that the Holy Quran its author is Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, himself, consciously, subconsciously, or unconsciously. The second assumption that can be is that Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, he obtained it from other human sources or from other religious scriptures. And the third is that the Holy Quran does not have a human author, but it is verbatim, the word or the revelation of God Almighty. Let us examine today all the three basic assumptions. The first being that Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, was the author himself, consciously, subconsciously or unconsciously. It is highly abnormal to challenge the testimony of a person who disclaims the responsibility of any great work, whether it be literally, whether it be scientific or otherwise. 
But this is exactly what the Orientalists do who doubt the origin of the Quran when they say that Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, was the author. The Prophet never ever claimed that he was the author of the Quran. In fact, he always said that it was a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To think otherwise is illogical and would mean that he was telling a lie, God forbid. History tells us that never has the Prophet been ever reported of telling a lie till prophethood. That is till the age of 40. And all the people acclaimed him as a person who was honest, who was noble, who was chaste. No wonder they gave him the title Al Amin, the trustworthy, friends and foes alike. Even those people who said that he was a liar, God forbid, after he claimed prophethood, even then they kept their valuables with him for safekeeping. Then why should an honest person lie and say that the Quran is a word of God and that he was a prophet? Let's examine the claims made by these Orientalists. Some say that Prophet Muhammad may peace be upon him. He attributed the Quran and said he was a prophet for material gain, for worldly benefits. I do agree. There are several people who falsely claim to be prophets, saints and preachers for wealth. And they acquire riches and lead a luxurious life. We have several throughout the world, especially in our country, India. Prophet Muhammad was financially better off before than after prophethood. He had married a rich businesswoman by the name of Khatija. May Allah be pleased with her at the age of 25, 15 years before prophethood. And his life, after he claimed that he was a prophet, was unenviable. According to the collection of Hadith by An-Nawi in Riyadh al Hadith number 482, it says that Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, who was the wife of beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, said that there were times when one or two months would pass without having fire being lit in the house because they did not have any cooked food. They survived on water and dates and sometimes supplemented by the goat milk given by the people of Medina. <clears throat> this was not just a temporary phase, it was a way of life for the Prophet. According to Riyadh al-Salihin, hadith number 465 and 466, Hazrat Bilal, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that whenever the Prophet received gifts and provisions for the future, he gave it to the poor and the needy and never kept it back for himself. Then why should you doubt that the Prophet told a lie, Nauzubillah, for material gains? And there is a verse in the Quran which negates this theory. It is from Surah Al-Baqarah. Chapter number 2, verse number 79, which says, فَبَيْلُّ لِلَّذِينَ يَقْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابَ بِأَيْدِهِمْ Then woe to those who write the book with their own hands. ثُمَّ يَقُلُونَ هَذَا مِنْ إِنْدِ اللَّهِ And then say, this is from Allah. لِيَشْتَرُ بِهِ سَمَنًا كَلِيلًا To traffic with it for a miserable price. فَبَيْلُّ لَوْ مِمَّا قَتَبَتْ أَيْدِهِمْ Then woe to those for what their hands do write. فَبَيْلُّ لَوْ مِمَّا يَقْتِبُونَ 
and go to those for what they earn. This verse is talking about the people who wrote the book with their own hands and said it's from God Almighty or they changed the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There were every possibility that if Prophet Muhammad may peace be upon him, himself would have written the Quran and attributed it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in some point of his life he would have been exposed then he would be called as the biggest hypocrite and would be cursing himself in his own book some people say that Prophet Muhammad the peace be upon him attributed the Quran to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and called him himself a prophet for status, for power, for glory, for leadership. What are the qualities of a person who wants power, status, leadership and glory? He wears fancy clothes, he eats very good food, he lives in mansions, in monumental buildings, he has guards, etc. Our beloved prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, he made his own goat. He mend his own clothes. He repaired his own shoes. He even many a times did the household work. He was an amazing model of simplicity and humbleness. He sat on the floor. He went to shop in the market without any guards. Even when the poor people used to invite him, he used to dine with them and eat graciously whatever was given to him. So much for that, that his detectors had mentioned the Quran in Surah Tawbah. Chapter number 9, verse number 61 said, Oh, he listens to everybody. What kind of a person is this? He listens to every Tom, Dick and Harry. Once, when a representative of the pagan Arabs by the name of Udba, he came to the Prophet and said, If you give us this claim of prophethood, we will give you all the wealth in Arabia. We will make you the leader of Arabia and crown you the king. Only thing that we want is that you should give up this message that there is only one God. And the Prophet refused by the revelation of the Qur'an from Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41. There were several attempts made, once through his uncle Abu Talib, that you give up your message and we will make you the wealthiest man in Arabia. The Prophet said, Oh my uncle, even if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, I will not give up this mission until I die. Why should a person lead a life of such suffering and sacrifices when he was triumphant even with his adversaries? And he was so humble and noble that at all the time of victory, he always said, it is due to the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not my own genius. Some of the Orientalists, they come up with a new theory that the Prophet, he was suffering from mythomania, God forbid. Mythomania is a mental disorder in which a person tells a lie and he believes in it. So they said that Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, told a lie, knows Billah, and he believed in it. If a psychiatrist has to treat a mythomaniac, he will pose him with facts because these people can't face facts. Suppose a person says, I'm the king of England. The psychiatrist will not tell him that he's crazy, he's mad. He will say, okay, if you're the king of England, where's your queen? He will say, she's gone to my mother-in-law's place. 
Where is your minister? He has died. Where are the guards? The moment you keep on posing facts, finally the Mithomi Naik will say, I think I'm not the king of England. The Quran does the same. Quran poses the people with facts and questions. In fact, it is not Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, who was a mythomaniac. It is these people who are actually mythomaniacs because they say that the Prophet lied and they believe in it. And Quran treats such people by posing facts, by posing questions. If you doubt, if you think that the Quran has been forged, do so and so, so and so thing. If you think that Quran is not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what about this? It poses several questions which we will be dealing with, inshallah, during the course of the talk. Some have come up with a theory called the religious illusion theory or the subconscious theory in which the Prophet, they say, Nauzbillah, used to, from his subconscious mind, he derived the Quran unknowingly. And some of them said he was crazy, God forbid. Let's analyze their claim. A person, if is suffering from this disease or if he's crazy, they fail to realize that the Quran was revealed during a course of time which was 23 years. The Quran was not revealed at one time. It was revealed over a period of 23 years in stages part by part. If this Quran, as they claim, is from a mind which is subconscious or a crazy mind, it could not have been so consistent. And neither can a person be under the false impression that he is the prophet when everything is coming from his subconscious mind for a period of 23 years. There are several facts in the Quran which can disprove this. For example, Quran mentions about several historical events which no one at the time of the prophet knew. There are several prophecies which are mentioned, which have been fulfilled. There are several scientific facts which were unknown that time and has been confirmed today. It is impossible for these sort of facts to come out from a subconscious mind or a crazy mind. And the Quran testifies in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 184. Do they not reflect? that the companion is not one possessed with evil, but he is a perpetuous warner. The Quran repeats in Surah Al-Qalam, chapter number 68, verse number 2, Thou is not, by the grace of thy Lord, crazy or possessed. It is said in Surah Taqweer, chapter number 81, verse number 22, Your companion is not possessed and mad. So why should a person lie? It's not possible to discuss all the various theories put forward by them. If anyone has any new theory, they are most welcome to put it during question answer time and inshallah I'll try my level best to clarify it. The second assumption is that the Prophet copied it from other religious scriptures or he got it from some human source. One historical fact is sufficient to prove this theory wrong. That is, our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, he was an illiterate and Quran testifies in Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 48, that thou was not able to recite any book before this book was revealed, nor was thou able to transcribe it before this. In that case, indeed, the talkers of vanities would have doubted. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that people would doubt the source of the Quran. That is the reason that in his divine wisdom, he chose his last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, to be an ummi, an illiterate, an unlettered prophet. Otherwise, surely the talkers of vanities, the babblers in the marketplace, would have something to say. And if the prophet was literate, the critics, the cynics, would have had some weight to say that the prophet copied it from somewhere else and rehashed it in a new form. No, Billah. But even this claim is denied. A point hardly big enough to hang a fly. And our Qari, Brother Ashraf Muhammadi, he recited the verse of the Quran from Surah Sajda, chapter number 32, verse number 1 to 3. Alif Lam Mim Tanzilu al Kitab al Arabi Me Rabbil Alameen. Alif Lam Mim. This is the revelation of the book, without doubt, from the Lord of the world. Do they say he has forged it? Nay, it is the truth from thy Lord. So that thou may admonish a people to whom no warner was sent before, so that they may receive some guidance. The Quran is unlike any other religious scriptures, which has a typical human type of narration, like a storybook. How does the storybook begin? It begins with, once upon a time, foxes and grapes, wolf and the lamb. Similarly, if you read other scriptures, it says, in the beginning was God, he made the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the word, it may say. Now it came to pass as though so it happened. The Quran does not have such human narration. In the beginning was so and so. And if you read the other religious scriptures, they have a typical sequence of the human narration. It talks about a particular person, it talks about his family, about the children, and the sequence runs in order. Chapter 1, chapter 2, it's in order. Quran 2 speaks about people and the family life, but it speaks not in a particular sequence like the human story book. The Quran has its own unique style. It's a unique book. The people who cannot prove that Quran is a work of a human being, when they finally come up and say that the Quran is a deception. No, Billah. If you ask them, where is the deception? They will not be able to point out a single deception in the whole Quran. People, they believe in things for which they have got no proof or reason. And they fool themselves by sticking to it. For example, if I believe that this particular man is my enemy, for which I've got no proof, for which I've got no reason. But the moment that man comes in front of me, because of my false belief, I start behaving like his enemy. He reacts and too behaves like my enemy. And then I satisfy myself. See, I was right. This man is my enemy. Because he's behaving like my enemy. If it had not been for my initial false belief, that man would have never behaved like my enemy. So people believe in things without proof and reason and fool themselves by sticking to it. Quran says that the revelation goes in parallel with reason. Some people say that holy scriptures they are beyond reasoning. If they are beyond reasoning, then how can we decipher which of the holy scriptures 
are true and which are false. The Quran, in fact, encourages reasoning. It encourages discussion. Many Muslims feel that you should avoid religious discussion. You should avoid getting into a dialogue where religion is concerned and they are sadly mistaken. The Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, That is, invite all the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Quran encourages discussion, encourages reasoning. No wonder the Arabic word Talu, which means they say, is mentioned 332 times. And the Arabic word Qul, which means say, is also mentioned 332 times. This proves that the Quran encourages discussion. There is a theory known as exhausting the alternatives. The Quran says that this book, this book, the Quran, it is a revelation from God Almighty. If it is not, then what is it? You give the other alternatives. Some may say it's the handiwork of Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him. It has been disproved. Some may say he lied for material gain, loud billah. That has been disproved. Whatever claim they have got, put forth and see whether they stand the test. This is the Quran. It's a book. It's paper and ink. Where did it come from? It requires an explanation. The Quran says it's from Allah. It's from God Almighty. If it's not, where did it come from? In Surah Jashia, chapter number 45, verse number 1 and 2, which says, Hameem, Tanzilu Kitab, Min Allahi Aziz al Hakim. Hameem. This is the revelation of the book. From Allah, the exalted in power, full of wisdom. And Quran mentions in several places that this is a revelation from God Almighty. It's mentioned in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 19. In Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 92. In Surah Yusuf, chapter number 12, verse number 1 and 2. In Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 113. In Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 6. It's mentioned in Surah Sajda, chapter number 32. Verse number 1 to 3. It's mentioned in Surah Yasin, chapter number 36. Verse number 1 to 3. In Surah Al Zumar, chapter number 39. Verse number 1. In Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40. Verse number 2. It's mentioned in Surah Jasha, chapter number 45. Verse number 2. It is mentioned in Surah Rahman, chapter number 55. Verse number 2. It's mentioned in Surah Waqia, chapter number 56. Verse number 77 and 80. It's mentioned in several places. It's mentioned in Surah Insan, chapter number 76. Verse number 23. In several places the Quran says, this is a revelation from God Almighty. If it is not, what is it? The scientific community, they have a different approach. If anyone has a new theory, they say, we don't have time to listen. And they have a reason for that. They say that if you have a new theory, don't bring it to me unless you have a way, unless you have a test to prove your theory wrong. Unless you don't have a way or a test to prove your theory wrong, I don't have time to waste with you. It's called as the falsification test. That's the reason that Albert Einstein, in the beginning of the century, when he gave a new theory that I feel that the universe works like that. Along with that theory, he gave three falsification tests, saying that if you think my theory is wrong, do these three things and my theory will be proved wrong. 
the scientists they examined it for six years and then said yes the theory of Albert Einstein is correct that does not mean that he's a great person it means he deserves a listening Quran has several such falsification tests when you get into a discussion in future with anyone regarding religion you have to ask him that do you have a way to prove your religion wrong believe me I have not come across any person who has told me that I have a way to prove my religion wrong the Quran has the Quran has several falsification tests some of them were only meant for the past some of them are applicable for all time let me give you a few examples the Prophet had an uncle by the name of Abu Lahab he was the staunchest opponent of the Prophet whenever the Prophet spoke to any stranger he used to follow the Prophet the moment the Prophet departed he used to go to the stranger and ask what did the Prophet tell you did he say it is day it's night did he say it's black it's white he spoke exactly of what the Prophet said and there's a full chapter Surah Lahab chapter number 111 of the Quran which was revealed and it says that Abu Lahab and his wife they will perish in hell and it says indirectly that these people will never accept Islam they will never become Muslim this surah was revealed 10 years before the death of Abu Lahab in that span of time many of his friends who were also opponents of Islam embraced Islam but Abu Lahab did not embrace Islam since he used to lie always against the Prophet the only thing he had to do to prove the Quran wrong was to say I'm a Muslim he did not have to behave like a Muslim he did not have to act like a Muslim he only had to say I'm a Muslim and the Quran would have been proved wrong it was so easy for him to prove the Quran wrong since he lied before he just had to tell an additional lie it is as though the Prophet is telling him you think I'm your enemy come on say this say I'm a Muslim and I'll be proved wrong it was so easy but he did not say it this proves that no human being can make such a statement in his book it has to be a divine revelation another such example is in Surah Al-Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 94 and 95 which says that they say that the last home of Allah is with them alone it is meant for them alone and no one else and the Quran continues tell them that if the last home for Allah is for them alone tell them to seek for death they will never seek for death because of the sins they have committed this was re revealed during a discussion during a confrontation between the Jews and the Muslims and the Jews said that the last home of Allah that is the paradise is for the Jews alone and not for anyone else so what was revealed saying that if you think that paradise is specially meant only for the Jews you call for death seek for death and the Quran says they will never seek for death the only thing the Jews had to do at that time any one of them any one of those Jews a single person would have come out and said I seek for death I want to die not that he had to die not that he had to act only thing he had to do was seek for death say I want to die and the Quran would have been proved wrong it was so easy to prove the Quran wrong but none of the Jews came forward and said that I seek for death
it's a falsification test. But now you may tell me that all these tests of the past, how can we prove the Quran wrong today if we want to prove it wrong? Quran has tests, falsification tests, which are also meant for all time, for that time and for today and till eternity. The Quran mentioned that many people claimed and said that the Quran is false. So Quran tells them. It's mentioned in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 88, that say if all the humankind and jinns were to gather together to produce the life of the Quran, they will not be able to do it even if they help each other. It's a challenge that if all the humankind and jinn gathered to produce the life of the Quran, they will not be able to do it even if they help each other. The Quran is acclaimed as the best Arabic literature on the face of the earth by Muslims and non-Muslims alike. The Arabic language of the Quran, it is so clear, so meaningful, intelligible, unsurpassable, miraculous. It does not deviate away from truth, even though it rhymes, unlike other poetry and literature. It is the highest order of rhetoric towards the revelation. The same verse of the Quran can convince even a common man as well as an intelligent person. It is a miraculous book. The same challenge that produce a recite like the Quran is given in Surah Tur, chapter number 52, verse number 34. Which later on, God Almighty, He made the test easy for the people in Surah Hud, chapter number 11, verse number 13, which says, Do they say He has forged it? Tell them, produce 10 such surahs forged. And let them call for help anyone besides Allah if they speak the truth. And no one could produce ten surahs exactly like the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further simplifies the test and says in Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 38, that do they say he has forged it? Say, produce one surah exactly forged like the Quran. One surah forged exactly like the Quran and call to help anyone besides Allah if you speak the truth. And they could not do it. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives an easiest of easy of the test. The easiest falsification test in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2. Verse number 27 24, which says, in kuntum fi mimma al And if you are in doubt as what we have revealed to our servant from time to time, fatu bi suratim min misli. Then produce a surah somewhat similar to it. Wad u shwada And call forth your helpers and witnesses, if there are any besides Allah, in kuntum sadiqeen. If you speak the truth. Fa illam tap alu, but if you cannot, walan tap alu, and of a surety you cannot. Fat taku naralati wa kudu hanna sabila jara. Then fear the fire, whose fuel shall be men and stones. O idatil kafirin, which is prepared for those who reject faith. First, the Quran gave a challenge. Produce a recite like the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa taala simplified and said produce ten surahs like the Quran. Then produce one surah. Here it says produce one surah somewhat similar. Mimmisli. The other places the Quran says misli. Here it says the Quran says misli. Here it says mimmisli. Somewhat similar to the Quran. And the non-Muslim Arabs they failed miserably when the Quran was revealed. Several Several pagan Arabs, they tried 
but they failed miserably. And some of their work is yet present in the historical books, and it makes them a laughing stock. The challenge was there 1400 years ago, it's even there today. Today, there are more than 14 million Coptic Christians. Christians who are Arab by birth. Arabic is the mother tongue. This test is even for them. Even if they want to try and prove the Quran wrong, only thing they have to do is produce one surah somewhat similar. And if you analyze certain surahs, certain chapters of the Quran are hardly three verses, hardly containing a few words. But so far no one has been able to do it and no one will be able to do it in future, inshallah. You may tell me that Arabic is not my mother tongue. So where do I fit in in this test? Quran has a test even for the non-Arabs. For people who don't know Arabic, everyone in the world, if they want, if they want to try and prove the Quran wrong, they can very well try the level best. I started my talk by quoting a verse from the Quran, from Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number, verse number 82, which says, Afala yudabbaroon al-Quran, walau kana min indi gairillah, la wajadu fi ikhtilafan kathira, that do not they consider the Quran with care, had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many contradictions, there would have been many discrepancies. The Quran is saying that if you want to prove the Quran wrong, just point out a single contradiction, a single discrepancy, a single fault in the Quran, and the Quran will be proved not to be the word of God. It's so easy. I do know that there are hundreds of people who have pointed out mistakes and contradictions in the Quran. Believe me, all of them, 100% are either out of context, the misquotations, mistranslations, to deceive the people. So far, no one has been able to take out a single contradiction or a single mistake in the Quran. Suppose, there is a Maulana who is very well versed in the history of Islam but is not very well versed with the scientific knowledge. I do know of several Maulanas who are well versed in Islam as well as science but suppose there is a Maulana who is only well versed with the historical facts of Islam but is not well versed with science and suppose you go to that Maulana and tell him that here there is a scientific mistake in the Quran. Just because he cannot clarify that scientific mistake, the alleged scientific mistake in the Quran, that does not mean that Quran is not a word of God, because Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 59, that ask the person who is well acquainted with those things. If you want to ask about the Quran, if the Quran speaks about science, ask a scientist. And he will clarify what does the Quran say. Similarly, suppose any one of the audience, they point out an Arabic grammatical mistake in the Quran. I'm not an expert in Arabic, I'm just a student. And if I cannot clarify that Arabic mistake, if I'm able to, Alhamdulillah. But if I'm not able to clarify that Arabic mistake, since I'm not an expert, that does not mean that Quran is proved wrong. You have to go and ask a person who is an expert in the field of Arabic. So far, no one has been able to take out a fault in the Quran. And inshallah, no one will ever be able to take out a fault in the Quran. After these logical explanations, No human being who believes in a God can say that Quran is not from God. 
those people who do not believe in God Almighty, if they say it is different, but a person who does not, who is not a Muslim, but if he believes in God after producing these proofs, even he cannot say it is not from God. So the only third basic assumption remains is that it is a divine origin. The Quran has a divine origin. It's from God Almighty. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Regarding the atheists, those who don't believe in God, all those atheists that are present here, I would like to congratulate them. My special congratulations to the atheists because they are using their intellect. They are using their reasoning power. Most of the people in the world who believe in a God, they are doing blind belief. He's a Christian because father is a Christian. He's a Hindu because father is a Hindu. Some Muslims are Muslim because their fathers are Muslim. They are doing blind belief. This is yes, even though he may belong to a religious background, to a religious family, he thinks that how is it possible that the people around me, they are worshipping a God which has got human qualities, qualities same as me. How can I believe in such a God? So he says, there is no God. He rejects. Some Muslim ask me, Zakir, how come you are congratulating an atheist? I am congratulating an atheist because he has said the first part of the Shahada, the Islamic creed, La ilaha, there is no God. Now the only part remaining is Illallah, but Allah, which we shall do inshallah. He has agreed with the first part of the Shahada. That there is no God. He does not believe in a God which has got human qualities. So it's our duty now to prove to him about the one and true God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment an atheist tells me, I do not believe in a God, I will ask him a question. What is the definition of God? What do you mean by God? And he has to answer. You know why? Suppose I tell you that this is a pen. If I say this is a pen, for you to say it is not a pen, you have to know the meaning of a pen. You should know the definition of a pen. You may not know what this is. But if I say this is a pen, and if you have to say this is not a pen, you should at least know the meaning of a pen, the definition of a pen. In the same way, if an atheist says there is no God, he should know what is the meaning of God. And the atheists, they tell me that see, these people around me, what they worship, what gods they worship, it is their own creation. They have got human qualities. Therefore, I do not believe in these gods. I tell him that even I don't believe in such God because the concept of God that these people have is the wrong concept. Since you reject the wrong concept, even I as a Muslim reject these wrong concepts of God, La ilaha. But the moment I agree with him, I have to also tell him the true concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Suppose there's a non-Muslim who believes that Islam is a ruthless religion. It is a merciless religion. It is a religion connected with terrorism. It is a religion which does not give rights to the woman. It's a religion which conflicts with science. And if he rejects Islam, I will tell him, I too reject such a religion which is merciless, which is ruthless, which does not give rise to the woman, which is unscientific. At the same time, 
I have to correct the concept of Islam and tell him that Islam is a religion which is merciful. It has got nothing to do with terrorism. It gives equal rights to the woman. It does not conflict with science. It conciliates with science. Then, inshallah, the non-Muslims will accept the religion of Islam. It's our duty to correct the concept. In the same manner, I have to correct the concept of God Almighty, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the atheists. The best definition that I can give of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of God Almighty, from the Holy Quran, is Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, which says, Say He is Allah, one and only. Allah, Allah, the absolute and eternal. Meaning, He is absolute, He is eternal. He has no beginning, he has no end. He is the one who does not require any help. He does not require things to eat. He does not require sleep. He is the one who helps other people but does not require help. Allah Samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid walam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. He has got no father and mother. He has got no children, no begotten children. And there is nothing unto him like in this world. There is nothing comparable to him in this world. The moment you can compare Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to anyone, he is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If anyone who you claim to be God Almighty, who you claim to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fits in this four-line definition, be Muslim, we have got no objection to accept him as God Almighty, to accept him as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What? Which are your candidates? Bring your candidates one by one. Some may say that Bhagwan Rajnish, oh show, he is God Almighty. Let's put him to test. The first criteria is Qul Allahu Ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Rajnish, we have several people like Rajnish. We have plenty of them in our country. But still, a follower of Rajnish will say, No, Rajnish is unique. He's only one. Okay, give him a chance. Okay, let him pass the first test. No problem. The second test is Allah Samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. He does not require any help. He is the person who helps other people. Rajnish, we know very well. He was suffering from asthma, from diabetes. He could not cure his own disease. What will he cure your disease and my disease? When he went to America, he was imprisoned by the American government. Imagine God being imprisoned. He could not free himself. How will he free you and me when we are in trouble? And then he gives a statement that they gave me poison, slow poisoning. Imagine God can be poisoned. Put him to test. The Archbishop of Greece said that if you do not throw this God man Rajnish out, he will destroy his houses and the house of his disciple, and the president had to throw him out of Greece. Is he absolute and eternal? The third test, Lam yalid valam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. I don't know how many children he had, but I do know that he had a father and a mother. He was born on the 11th of December, 1931, in Jabalpur. And he died on the 19th of January, 1990. But when you go to his center in Pune, 
there it is mentioned bhagwan rajnish never born never died but visited the earth from the 11th of december 1931 to the 19th of january 1990 there is no mention that he was not allowed to enter 21 countries of the world he was not given the visa he tried to enter he could not enter 21 countries imagine god is visiting the world god is visiting the world he can't visit 21 countries is this the god you believe in and the last says wala me qul la kufu wan ad and there is nothing like it there is nothing like him in this world there is nothing there is nothing comparable the moment you can think what god is you can draw a figure he is not god we know very well that rajnish he had long hair he had a big flowing beard which was white in color he wore a robe the moment you can think you can draw a picture of god he is not god wala me qul la kufu wan ahad if you say that god almighty suppose he is a thousand times as strong as anil swashnigar do you know anil swashnigar he was crowned mr universe the strongest man in the world if you say that god almighty is a thousand times as strong as anil swashnigar or dara singh or maybe king kong he is not god the moment you can compare him with anyone whether a thousand times whether a million times whether 10 million times the moment you can compare him with anything he is not god wala me yaqul lahu kufu wan ahad there is nothing unto him like in this world i leave it up to the distinguished audience the intellectual audience to decide for themselves that whichever god they worship in whichever god they are worshiping let them put their god to test to the four tests of the quran if the god you are worshiping if they pass the four tests we muslims we have got no objection in accepting him as god almighty otherwise you can decide for yourself after after giving these proofs some atheists they may agree that now we believe in such a god but most of the atheists will not agree they will say we don't just believe in such definition we believe in something which is ultimate we believe in science i do agree today is the age of science and technology so let's put the scientific knowledge that we have let's as apply it to the quran did they say they say this is a world of science and technology we don't believe in such god prove to us scientifically the existence of god then we will believe in it the first thing i would like to ask a question to did they say or any educated man who does not believe in a god and who believes only in science that can you tell me the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of an unknown object there is an object an unknown object an unknown machine which no one in the world has ever seen before or heard of before now this machine is bought in front of that atheist or the educated man who believes in science that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this unknown object i have asked this question to hundreds of atheists after a little bit of thinking he replies maybe the creator the person who has created that object some may say the inventor some may say the manufacturer some may say the producer whatever they will say believe me it will be somewhat similar either the creator the maker the manufacturer the inventor i have asked this question to hundreds of atheists and all have given me 
somewhat similar answer. Whatever answer they give me, I accept it. I only keep it in my mind. It will be somewhat similar. The next person may be the person who the creator has told, or maybe someone does a research. But the first person will be the creator, the manufacturer, the inventor, or the producer. I ask that atheist who believes in science, how did this world come into existence? How did our universe come into existence? So he tells me that initially the full universe was one mass, the primary nebula. Then there was a big bang, the secondary separation, which gave rise to galaxies. And then for the stars and the planet in which we live, I ask him, where did you get all these fairy tales from? He says, no, these aren't fairy tales. These are established facts. We have got proof for this. I say, where did you learn? When did you learn all these fairy tales? He says, no, these are scientific facts. They aren't fairy tales. We learned it yesterday. Yesterday in science means 50 years back, maybe 100 years back, yesterday. And in 1973, a couple of scientists got the Nobel Prize for describing the Big Bang Theory. So I tell him, okay, you say it is a fact, I accept it. But what do you have to say about what is mentioned in this Quran 1400 years ago? It mentions in Surah Al-Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. Awalam yara lazina kafru. Do not the unbelievers see anna samawati wal arda kanat ratkan fafatakna huma that the heavens and the earth we join together and we clove them asunder. My Quran, which was revealed 1400 years ago, there are enough historical proof to show it was a book which was present 1400 years ago. How come my Quran says it speaks about a Big Bang theory? It speaks in a nutshell. You say it was discovered yesterday, 50 years back, 100 years back. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? So they tells me, maybe somebody guessed. I don't challenge him. I don't challenge him. I proceed. The world we live in, what is the shape? He tells me, previously people thought the world was flat and people were afraid to venture too far lest they would fall over. But now we have enough scientific proof to show it is not flat, it is spherical. When did you learn? Yesterday, 100 years back, 200 years back in science. And if he has a good knowledge, he replies that the first person who proved that the world was spherical was Sir Francis Drake in 1597. I pose him a question. Analyze what does the Quran say? In Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 29, it says, that it is Allah who merges the night into day and merges the day into night. Merging means a slow and a gradual change. The night slowly and gradually changes to day and the day slowly and gradually changes to night. This phenomena is not possible if the world is flat. It's only possible if the world is spherical. A similar message is given for al zumur chapter number 39. Verse number five, that the night overlaps the day and the day overlaps the night. The Arabic word used this kawara, as though you coil a turban round your head, coiling. This coiling, this overlapping of the night over the day and the day over the night is only possible if the earth is spherical. It's not possible if the earth is flat. You tell me. It was discovered recently. Can you account for who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago? Maybe. It's a good guess. It's a wide guess. It's a wild guess. But it was a guess. I don't challenge him. I proceed. The light that we have, 
the light that we obtain from the moon. Where does it come from? So he will tell me that previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. But today, after science has advanced, we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it's a reflected light of the sun. I will ask him a question. That it is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Al Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61. Blessed is he who has created the constellations and placed therein a lamp and a moon which has reflected light. The Arabic word for moon is Qamar. And the light described there is Munir, which is borrowed light, or Nur, which is a reflection of light. The Quran mentions that the light of the moon is reflected light. You say you discovered it today. How come it's mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago? He will pause for a time. He won't reply immediately. And then may say, maybe, maybe it's a fluke. I don't argue with him. For sake, just for the sake of the discussion, I say, okay, you say it's a guess. I don't argue with you. Let's proceed. I asked him that when I was in school, I passed my 10th standard in 1982. I had learned that the sun was stationary. The sun revolved, but it was stationary. So he asked me, does this what the Quran says? I said, no, this is what I learned in school. Is it true? He said, no. Today, science is advanced. Recently, we came to know that the sun, besides revolving, it also rotates. It is not stationary. It rotates about its axis. And if you have an equipment, you can have the image of the sun on a tabletop. The sun has got black spots. And it takes about 25 days for these black spots to complete one rotation. In short, the sun takes about 25 days to complete one rotation. Does the Quran say to stationary? He starts laughing. Ha ha. I said, no. My Quran says in Surah Al-Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33. Huwa allazi khalaqa al-layla wa nahara wa shamsa wa al-qamar kullun fi falaki yazbahoon It is Allah who has created the night and the day, the sun and the moon, each one rotating about its own axis. It revolves and rotates. Each one rotating about its own axis. You tell me, who could have mentioned this scientific fact in the Quran, which was discovered recently? He's silent. And after a long pause, he replies, Let's see, the Arabs, were very well advanced in the field of astronomy. So maybe some Arabs told your prophet and he mentioned this in his book. I do agree. I do agree that the Arabs were very well advanced in the field of astronomy. But I remind him that his dates are very poor. The Quran was revealed centuries before the Arab became advanced in the field of astronomy. So it is from the Quran which the Arab learned about astronomy. It's not the vice versa. The Quran mentions about several scientific facts. The Quran says regarding the field of geography, regarding water cycle. It says in Surah Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 21, that seest not thou that it is Allah who sends down rain from the top, from the sky, and leads it into the sources of the earth and causes fields of various colors to grow. Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. It says in several other verses that the water from the ocean rises up, it forms into clouds, the clouds condense, there is lightning and rain falls from the cloud. It's mentioned in several places in the Quran. It's mentioned in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. It's mentioned in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. It's mentioned in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. It's mentioned in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 48. In several places, the Quran describes in detail. 
this for a cycle which was discovered by Bernard Palissy in 1580. Only in the year 1580 was this present coherent water cycle discovered. Who could have mentioned the Quran 1400 years ago? In the field of geology, that atheist will tell you that there is a phenomena known as folding. The earth that we live, live on, the earth's crust is very thin. These mountain ranges, due to the phenomena of folding, prevent the earth from shaking. It gives stability to the earth. I tell him that the Quran mentions in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 6 and 7, six and seven that we have made the earth as an expanse was Jibal Autada and the mountains as sticks. The Quran says that the mountains are made as sticks, as pegs. And this is the description which the scientists give us today. That's like the tent pegs. The mountains are like tent pegs. And Quran gives more information in Surah Al Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 31. It says that we have set on the earth mountains standing firm lest it would shake. Quran says that they have made the mountain to prevent the shaking of the earth. That atheist will tell us that even though the salt water and the sweet water, though they meet, they do not mix. They remain separate. I, I will point out to him a verse from the Quran, from Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 53, which says, It is Allah who has created two bodies of free flowing water, one sweet and palpable, and the other salt and bitter. And between them, he has made a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. A similar message is given in Surah Rahman, chapter number 55, verse number 19 and 20, that he has made two bodies of water. Between them is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Today science tells us that salt water and sweet water do not mix. There is a partition. He may tell me that maybe some Arab, maybe some Arab went underwater and he saw the partition and mentioned the Quran. They fail to realize that this is an unseen barrier. The Quran says Barzakh, an unseen barrier. And this phenomena is very much evident in Cape Town, that is the southernmost tip of Africa. Even in Egypt, when the Nile flows into the Mediterranean Sea, and the best example is the Gulf Stream, which runs for thousands of miles. Both the waters are present, but they do not mix. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ قُلْ لَا شَيْنْ hai. We have created every living thing from water. Will they not then believe? Afala yuminun? Will you not then believe? Quran says, we have created every living thing from water. Will you not then believe? Imagine, in the deserts of Arabia, where there is scarcity of water, who would have ever thought that every living creature is made of water? If they had to guess, they would have guessed everything but water. And today science tells us that cytoplasm, which is the main constituent of the cell, it contains 80% of water. And every living creature contains 50 to 90% water. Who could have mentioned this fact in the Quran 1400 years ago? And that atheist is mum. He does not give you a reply. There is a theory in mathematics known as the theory of probability. Now suppose there are two options. 
and out of those two options, one is right and one is wrong. The chance is that if you make a wild guess, you will get the right answer. It will be one out of two. It will be 50 percent, for example, if I toss a coin. The chances that I will get the right answer is one out of two. It is 50 percent. If I toss a coin the second time, the chances I'll be correct the second time is one out of two, it is 50 percent. But the chances that I'll be correct in both the tosses, first and second, will be one out of two into one out of two, that is one fourth, or 50 percent, or 50 percent, that is 25 percent. If I throw a dice, the dice has got six sides. One, two, three, four, five, six. The chance is if I make a wild guess, I will be right, is one out of six. The chance is I'll be correct all three times. The first toss, the second toss, and the third throw. The chance is I'll be correct all three times, is one out of two, into one out of two, into one out of six. Will be one upon twenty-four. Let's apply this theory of probability to the Quran. Suppose we agree for sake of argument. Possible a person guessed. All the matter that's mentioned in the Quran, maybe somebody has guessed. Let us put this theory of probability to the Quran. The Quran says that the world is spherical. What different shapes can a person think of the earth? Some may say it is flat, some may say it is triangular, some may say it is quadrangular, some may say it is it has five, it has five sides pentagonal, some may say hexagonal, some may say heptagonal, some may say octagonal, some may say spherical. Let's say, assume that you can think of about 30 different shapes for the earth. The chances that if anyone makes a wild guess, he will be right is 1 upon 30. The light of the moon, it can be its own light or it can be reflected light. The chances that if anyone makes a wild guess, he will be right is 1 upon 2. But the chances that both his guesses, the earth is spherical and the light of the moon is reflected, both are correct, is 1 upon 30 into 1 upon 2, that is 1 upon 60. In the deserts of Arabia, what can a person think that the human being can be made of, that the living creatures can be made of? What are the options? What different options can you think of that a living creature can be made of? A person in the desert may think it is made of sand, maybe it's made of wood, maybe it's made of aluminium, of iron, of copper, of oil, of water, of hydrogen, of oxygen. You can make at least 10,000 guesses. And the last that anyone will guess in the deserts of Arabia is water. But the Quran says that every living thing is made of water. In Surah Al-Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. It says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 45, that every animal is made of water. And in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 54, every human being is made of water. If you make a wild guess, the chances that you'll be right is 1 upon 10,000. The chances that if anyone makes three guesses and all three will be right, that the earth is spherical, that the light of the moon is reflected light, and every living thing you made of water will be 1 upon 30 into 1 upon 2 into 1 upon 10,000. It is 1 upon 60,000. It works out to 0.0017 percentage. I leave it up to you, the audience, to decide for yourself that if you apply this theory of probability to the Quran, the Quran mentions hundreds of facts which were unknown at that time. If anyone made a guess, the chances that all the hundreds will be right, it will be somewhere very, very close to zero, 
and in the theory of probability, it will be zero. Some may pose the question that Zakir, are you using scientific knowledge to prove the Quran? I would like to remind them that Quran is not a book of science. S C I E N C E. It is a book of science. S I G N S. Quran has got 6,000 signs, ayat, more than 6,000, out of which more than 1,000 have scientific knowledge. I am not using science to prove the Quran, right? Because to prove anything right, you have to use a yardstick, something which is ultimate. For us Muslims, the ultimate is the Quran. Ultimate yardstick is the Quran. Quran is a Furqan. It is a criteria to judge right from wrong. But for that atheist, for an educated man who does not believe in God, for him, science is the ultimate. It is his yardstick. So I'm using his yardstick to prove whatever Quran has said. And we know very well that many a time science takes few turns. Therefore, I have only spoken about scientific facts which have got evidence and proof. I have not talked about theories which are based on assumptions. I am using his yardstick to say that whatever your yardstick has said recently, 100 years back, it has already been mentioned in the Quran. And finally, we come to a common agreement that the Quran is more superior than science. So Quran is the ultimate yardstick, not science. Quran mentioned about several scientific facts. Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 53, that the plants have been created in pairs, which we discovered recently. It says in Surah Raj, chapter number 13, verse number 3, that the fruits are created in pairs. In the field of geology, it's mentioned in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38, that the animals and birds live in communities, which science has discovered recently. The Quran says in Surah Nahal, Chapter number 16, verse number 68 and 69. It is the female bee which goes out and collects the honey. It is not the male bee, which science has discovered recently. These bees, they describe the pathway of the new garden they have found by the flapping of the wings. It's mentioned in the Quran, which we discovered recently. The Quran says in Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, Verse number 41, that the house of the spider is fragile. Besides describing the physical nature of the web of the spider, it is also describing about the relationship, the family relation, in which many a time the female spider kills the male spider. The Quran says in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 17 and 18, that Ants are talking to one another. You may think it's a fairy tale book. What? Ants are talking to one another? Today science says us, the insect or the animal which has the closest resemblance to the lifestyle of the human being is the ant. It buried the dead. It has a very high system of communication. It has marketplaces, etc. Quran also speaks about medicine. It says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 16 and 69, that you get the honey from the belly of the bee, which we discover today. And in the honey, there is a healing for mankind. Today, science tells us that in the honey, there are antiseptic properties. No wonder the Russian soldiers used it to cover their wounds, which left very little scar tissue. 
it is used in the treatment of certain allergies. Quran speaks about physiology. It says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 66, and Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 21, it describes the blood circulation and the production of milk. And 600 years after the Quran speaks about blood circulation, Ibn Nafis discovered it. And 1,000 years after the revelation of the Quran, did William Harvey made it famous to the Western world. Quran speaks about embryology. The first verse of the Quran to be revealed was from Surah Alaq or Surah Ikra. It says, Ikra, Bismi Rabbi Kallazi Khalaq, Khalaq al Insana min Alaq. Read, recite, or proclaim in the name of thy Lord who created, who created the human beings from something which slings, a leech like substance. This and several other embryological data which is given in the Quran was taken to Professor Keith Moore who happens to be one of the highest authority in the field of embryology. He lives in Toronto in Canada and was asked the question, whatever matter the Quran speaks about embryology, is it true? Some Arabs followed the guidance of the Quran. If you are in doubt, ask the person who knows. So they asked Professor Keith Moore, is it true? He said, that majority, majority of the matter in the Quran is 100% perfect, matching with the latest discovery of embryology. But there are certain statements in the Quran which I cannot comment on because I myself do not know it. And one such verse was this that they have created the human beings from something which clings, a leech like substance. He said, I do not know whether an embryo looks like a leech. He went and got a photograph of a leech and examined in his laboratory in a very, under a very powerful microscope the early stages of an embryo and it exactly matched with the photograph. And then he said, whatever the Quran mentions is perfectly right. And whatever new data he got from the Quran, he incorporated it into his book, The Developing Human and took out a third edition for which he got the best medical book written by any person in that year. And he said that whatever the Quran mentioned, all the things about embryology we discovered recently. It's one of the latest branch of medicine. It cannot be written by any human being. It has to be of divine origin. The Quran says in Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 5 to 7, it says, Does not man think from what is created? He's created from a drop emitted from between his backbone and ribs. And today we know that the genital organs, the testes and the ovaries, during the embryonic age, they develop from where the kidney is placed between the backbone and the 11th and the 12th rib. The Quran says in Surah Najam, chapter number 53, verse number 45 and 46, and Surah Qiyama, chapter number 75, verse number 37 to 39, it says that it is the male which is responsible for the sex of the child, which we discovered recently. The Quran says that the embryo is covered that the fetus is covered in three waves of darkness, which is confirmed today. The Quran describes the embryonic stages in great detail. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verses 12 to 14, and in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 5, it says that the human beings have been created from a minute quantity of liquid, from something which clings a leech-like substance then made into a mudga, a chewed-like substance, then made into izaman, that is bone, then clothed with lahem, that is flesh. Quran describes the embryonic stages in great detail. The Quran also mentions Surah Sajda, chapter number 32, 
verse number 9 and surah insan chapter number 76 verse number 2 that it is allah who gives you the faculty of hearing and sight and today medical knowledge tells us that hearing comes first it is developed completely by the fifth month of pregnancy and then the eye is split open by the seventh month of pregnancy quran gives the reply in surah qiyamah chapter number 75 verse number 3 to 4 that when the question is posed how will allah subhanahu wa taala assemble the bones on the day of judgment allah replies that we will not only be able to assemble your bone we shall even assemble your very fingertips quran is saying allah subhanahu wa taala can also assemble your fingertips what does it mean in 1880 sir gold he described the method of fingerprinting which today we use it to identify people no two fingerprints even in a million people are identical quran speaks about fingerprinting method 1400 years ago there are several examples of science if you want to know more details about the scientific knowledge which is mentioned in the quran you can refer to my video cassette quran and modern science conflict the conciliation which is available for sale in the foyer i would like to give one more scientific fact that there was a scientist in thailand by the name of professor takashan who did a great deal of research in the field of pain receptors previously science thought that only the brain was responsible only the brain was responsible for the pain but recently we have discovered that there are pain receptors present in the skin which is responsible quran mentions surah nisa chapter number 4 verse number 54 that as to those who reject our signs we will cast them into the hell fire and as often as the skin is roasted we shall change it with the new skin so that they shall feel the pain indirectly quran is saying there is something in the skin which is responsible for the pain it is giving an indication about the pain receptors at first professor takashan could not believe on verification when he realized that this book is speaking about pain receptors 1400 years ago he embraced islam in a medical conference in cairo and said la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah that there is no god but allah and muhammad may peace be upon him is the messenger of allah then you pose the question to the atheist who could have mentioned all these scientific facts in the quran the only reply that he can give you is the same which he gave you earlier who is the person who can tell you the mechanism of an unknown object it is the creator it is the inventor it is the maker it is the producer in the same way the person who can mention all these facts in the quran is the maker is the producer is the creator of the universe and its content which we call in english language as god and more appropriately in the arabic language as allah Francis Bacon has rightly said that little knowledge of science makes you an atheist but an in-depth study of science makes you a believer in God almighty no wonder today scientists are eliminating the models of god but they are not eliminating god they are eliminating models of god la ilaha but not god illa allah i would like to end my talk by giving the translation of the second verse that i quoted in the beginning of my talk from surah fusilat chapter number 41 verse number 53 which says sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusihim hatta yatabayyana lahum annahu alhaq aw lam yakfi bi rabbika annahu ala kulli shay'in shahid soon we shall show them our sign in the furthest regions of the horizon 
and into their souls until it is clear to them that this is the truth. Wa akhru dawan alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Thank you, Jazakallah Khair, for the very rapt, uh, kind and rapt attention you all have shown during the course of the lecture. Now we come to the second part of our session and we hope to have a similar, in fact, a better interest of yours. That is the question and answer session. Arun Shauri says that in the Quran in chapter 4 verses 11 and 12 if you add up the different parts of inheritance given to the highs the sum total is more than one therefore Arun Shauri claims that the author of the Quran does not know math please clarify I was a Christian and embraced Islam in 1980 how can I convince my parents who are yet Christian that Prophet Muhammad please be upon him did not copy the Quran from the Bible. Dr. Sakir, is it not contradictory that the Quran calls Iblis an angel in one place and a genet another place? Now we believe that God is supernatural and He can do everything. A non-Muslim friend of mine has a question, why is it that God does not assume a human form? Can you please explain? There are a thousand things I can list which God Almighty can't do. God is not supernatural. God cannot do everything. God cannot do human forms. And one Muslim friend also told me that Islam believes that Jesus was born of a virgin and he was born by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he was not born in the natural way. Now this proves that Jesus Christ, if he is not God, at least he is greater than Muhammad. If suppose a person does not have a father and you claim because he does not have a father, he is God Almighty, Quran gives the answer in Surah Imran, Al-Imran, chapter number 3. Verse number 59, similitude of Jesus in front of Allah is the same as Adam. They were created from dust and say be it was. Adam may peace be upon him. Did I have a father? Adam may peace be upon him. He had no father. He had no mother. If you say a person does not have a father is God Almighty, Adam may peace be upon him is a bigger God. You know that Arun Shauri has written several articles and books against Islam. Why don't you challenge him to a public debate? Quran Sharif ke talim ke bamujo kya aap insani haq taslim karte hain ke insan khuda ke mutalik dunya ke aur hadi aur pegam bhai bhi aaye unhone kai baatein sunai wo padhne ko azadi aap taslim karte hain If you read the Vedas, it's mentioned in the Yurveda chapter number 3 was number 32 na tasya patima asti of that god you cannot make any image <laughs> the jayur veda says in chapter number 32 was number 3 god is formless and bodiless the same jayur veda chapter number 40 was number 8 says god has got no image has got no body same jayur veda Chapter number 40, verse number 9 says that all those who worship the uncreated things, they are in darkness. And it continues. Andhatma Pavishanti Ya Sambhuti Mupaste. Thank you, Jazakallah Khair, for the 
very rapt, uh, kind and rapt attention you all have shown during the course of the lecture. Now we come to the second part of our session and we hope to have a similar, in fact, a better interest of yours, that is the question and answer session. To derive more benefit for all present here today, in the limited time available to us, we would like the following rules to be observed during the question and answer session. First, questions asked should be on the topic, is the Quran God's word only? Questions not pertaining to the topic will not be entertained. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. This is a question and answer time and not a lecture or a debate time. Number three, only one question at a time may be asked. For your second question, you would have to go back at the row again and line up again and await your second chance for questioning. Questions on slips from the audience may be considered for answers from the speaker in the later part of the question and answer session only if time permits. You may pass on the question slips to the volunteers in the aisles or in the center who will in turn pass on the slips onto the stage. Three mics have been provided for the questions from the audience two for the gents next to the stage in front here and one at the back in the ladies section please stand in a queue at one of the mics if you wish to put a question to the speaker and speak directly into the mic only that also when the mic is handed over to you by the mic handling assistants. We will allow only one question on each of the mics. First a lady, then a gent on my right hand side, then a lady at the back again, then a gent on my left hand side, then a lady and so on. Uh, are the mic handling assistants ready? Uh, those who would like to ask questions on the mic, they may queue up on the two side mics and one at the back for their questions. We can start the session right away. The ladies ready at the mic, the gents at theirs. We start the questions. The speaker willing and ready at his. May we have the first question from the ladies, please? I would coordinate the session from the table. I think that would be better for me. The ladies can ask the first question. I am Mrs. Sharla Ramchandran. I would like to ask why do Muslims call God Allah? The question posed by the sister is why do Muslims call God as Allah? During my talk, I have given the definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the Quran, from Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, which says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Allah hu samad. Allah the absolute, the eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kufu and ahad. And there is nothing unto him like in this world. But, the Quran also says, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110, it says, Qulidullah, Awadur Rahman, Ayyabma Tad'u, Falaw Asma al Hasna. Say, call upon him by Allah or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful name. The same message that to Allah belongs the most beautiful name is mentioned in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 180. In Surah Hashar, chapter number 59, verse number 24. As well as in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 8, it says, To Allah belongs the most beautiful name. But the name 
should not men should not conjure up a mental picture it should be a beautiful name why do muslims prefer calling god almighty as allah than the english word god because the arabic word allah is a pure word the english word god it can be played around with if you add an s to god it become god plural of god you can't add s to allah there is nothing like plural allah allah is one qul huwa allahu ahad say is allah one and only if you add a d e s s to god it becomes goddess a female god there's nothing like female allah or male allah allah has got no gender if you have a god with a capital g it becomes true god if you have a god with a small g it becomes fake god in islam we have only one true allah we don't have any fake allah only true allah if you add father to god it becomes godfather he is my godfather he is my guardian you can't add a abba to allah or a father to allah there is nothing like allah abba or allah father in islam If you add a mother to God, become Godmother. You can't add a mother to Allah or a ummi to Allah. There's nothing like Allah in Islam. If you add, if you put a tin before God, it becomes tin God, fake God. In Islam, there's nothing like tin Allah. Allah is pure. He is unique. You can call him by any name, but it should be a beautiful name. I hope that answers the question. May all the speakers kindly note, uh, questioners kindly note that they should state their name and occupation before they put forward their question, so you get an exact, a more appropriate answer. Thank you. Uh, the next question from the gents on the right side. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Tazim Dabir. My question is: Arun Shauri says that in the Quran, in chapter four, verses eleven and twelve, if you add up the different parts of inheritance. given to the highs the sum total is more than one therefore arun shori claims that the author of the quran does not know math please clarify the brother posed the question that according to arun shori in the quran in chapter number 4 verse number 11 and 12 he says if you add up the sum total of all the different parts of the hairs the total comes to more than one therefore he claims that the author of the quran does not know math as i mentioned to in my talk there are hundreds of people who have taken faults in the quran but if you analyze all of them are not true none of them are true not a single one is true regarding inheritance quran speaks about inheritance in several places in surah baqarah chapter number 2 was number 180 in surah baqara chapter number 2 was number 240 in surah nisa chapter number 4 was number 9 it's mentioned surah nisa chapter number 4 was number 19 it's mentioned surah maida chapter number 5 was number 105 in several places but regarding the detailed explanation of the shares it's mentioned in the quran in surah nisa chapter number 4 was number 11 and 12 and in surah nisa chapter number 4 verse number 176 regarding the translation of the verse quoted by arun shuri that is surah nisa chapter number 4 verse number 11 and 12 it says that regarding the shares of inheritance for your children the male gets a part double than that of a female If only daughters two or more, they share in a two-third. If only daughter one, she gets half. And the verse continues. As regarding the parents, they each get one-sixth share if they have children. If no children, then mother gets one-third after paying off the legacies and debts. Verse number twelve says, 
that in what your wives leave for you, you get half if no children, and one fourth if there are children, after paying off the debts and legacies. In what you leave for your wife, they share one fourth if no children, and one eighth if there are children. It's a bit confusing. Don't get confused. You can go home and refer it. In short, in verse number 11 of Surah Nisa chapter 4, the first share that is mentioned is of the children, then of the parents, and later on in verse number 12 it gives the share of the spouses. Now regarding inheritance, Islam speaks in a great detail. Quran only gives the basic outline. The great details, you have to refer to the hadith. And a man can spend his full life only doing research on inheritance. And Arun Shuri, he expects to know about this just by quoting two verses. It is somewhat similar that a person wants to solve an arithmetical equation and does not know the basic rule of arithmetic that is board mass. According to the rule of mod mass, B O D M A S, irrespective whichever arithmetical sign comes, whether they come first or last, first you have to solve brackets of B O, then D, that is division, then M, that is multiplication, then A, that is addition, and then S, that is subtraction. If you don't know the rule of board mass, and if first you do subtraction, then you do multiplication, then do addition, then do brackets off, you will surely get the answer wrong. In the same way, Arun Shuri himself does not know maths because for the division of inheritance, <laughs> for the division of inheritance, according to the Islamic law, first share goes to the spouses and the parents. After that, whatever is remaining is shared between the children. If you follow this rule, the sum total can never come more than one. I hope that answers the question. Bhatlavar Bandho, I... I'm asking, I'm telling you. May we have the next question from the lady's side? Then we will allow you, sir. Thank you. Hello. 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 My name is uh, Fauzia Sayyad. I am working in BMC as inspector. I was a Christian and embraced Islam in 1980. How can I convince my parents who are yet Christian that Prophet Muhammad, please be upon him, did not copy the Quran from the Bible? The, qu the sister posed the question that she has reverted to Islam. She has accepted Islam, first she was a Christian. I would like to congratulate her. Thrice, not once. To the atheist, I congratulate once. <laughs> to her, I congratulate thrice. Because after saying La ilaha, she said Illallah and then Muhammad Rasulullah. That is, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad, may peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. I would like to congratulate you. The question posed is that how can she prove, how can she convince your relatives that Quran has not been copied or Quran has not been plagiarized from the Bible? As I told you, that one historical fact that the Prophet was illiterate is sufficient to prove this. But Quran also says in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 157, that they follow the Prophet, the, uh, they follow the Messenger, the unlettered Prophet which is mentioned in the scriptures, the law and the gospel. And today, if you read the Bible, it is mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12. The book is given to a Prophet who is not learned. Quran says, it's mentioned in the scripture and if you open the Bible, it is there in Isaiah, Chapter number 29, verse number 12. Those orientalists who claim that the prophets copied from the Bible, now they fail to realize 
that there was no Arabic version of the Bible when the Prophet was present. The first, the earliest Old Testament in Arabic that we have was by R. Sadia Gaon in the year 900 CE, that is common error, more than 200 years after the death of the Prophet. And the earliest New Testament Arabic that we have was published by Erpinius in 1616, about a thousand years after the death of the Prophet. May peace be upon him. I do agree that there are some similarities between the Bible and the Quran. That does not indicate that the latter has been copied from the former. It can also mean that they both have a common third source. All the revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have the common message of monotheism. They have the common message. All the previous revelations, since they were time bound, as I mentioned, they have not been maintained in the original form and have been interpolated. And there are several concoctions which have been done by human beings. But there are bound to be a few points which are common. Just because of these similarities, it would be wrong to say that Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, copied from the Bible. Then it would also mean that Jesus, may peace be upon him, Nauzbillah, copied the New Testament from the Old Testament. Because there are many things common in the Old and the New Testament. Both of them had a common source. And suppose someone copies in an examination. Suppose I copy in, in an examination. I will not write in the answer paper, I have copied from my neighbor. I will not write, I have copied from Mr. XYZ. Muhammad may peace be upon him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly indicate that Jesus may peace be upon him, Moses may peace be upon him, all the other prophets were prophets of God Almighty. It gives them due credit and due respect. If he would have copied, he would not have mentioned that Jesus and Moses may peace be upon him were prophets of God. This proves he did not copy. Only based on historical facts, it is difficult for a person to say which of the two is correct, Bible or the Quran. But let us put it to test using a scientific knowledge. On the face of it, if you glance, many stories, many points mentioned in the Quran and the Bible are exactly the same. But if you analyze, there is a difference of chalk and cheese. Bible, for example, mentioned in the first book, in the book of Genesis, chapter number one, the creation of the universe, the heavens and the earth, it was created in six days. And the day is described as a 24 hour period. Quran 2 speaks of at several places. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 54. In Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 3. Several places that the heavens and the earth were created in six ayyam. The Arabic word ayyam is the plural of yom, which means day. Yom means day. It also means a very, very long period or an epoch. So here when the Quran says the heavens and the earth were created in six epochs, very, very long period, the scientists have got no objection to the description of the Quran. But to say that the world was created in six 24 days is unscientific. The Bible says in Genesis chapter number one, verse number 3 and 5, that the day and the night were created on the first day. And science tells us that the light circulating in the universe is due to a reaction of the stars. And the Bible says that the sun, Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 14 to 19 says, that the sun was created on the fourth day. How is it possible that the result, that is the light, was created three days before the sun? Then logical. 
It's unscientific. And the earth, which is required for the presence of day and night, was created on the third day. Quran 2 speaks about the creation of the light and the sun, but it does not give this impossible unscientific sequence. Do you think Prophet Muhammad may peace be upon him? He copied from the Bible and he made corrections in the sequence. No one knew 400 years ago. Bible says in Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 9 to 13, that the earth was created on the third day. And verse number 14 to 19 says, the sun and the moon was created on the fourth day. Today science tells us that the earth and the moon are parts of the original star, the sun. It's impossible that the earth was created before the sun. It's unscientific. Bible says that the vegetable kingdom, in Genesis chapter number 1, verses 11 to 13, the vegetable kingdom, along with the seed, seed bearing, plants, herbs, trees, etc., was created on the third day. And the sun, verses 14 to 19 says, was created on the fourth day. How can the vegetation come into existence without the sun? Bible says in Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 16, that God Almighty created two great lights. The sun, the greater light, to rule the day. And the moon, the lesser light, to rule the night. Bible says, the sun and the moon have its own light. And as I mentioned earlier, Quran clarifies in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, that the light of the moon is its reflected light. How is it possible that our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, copied and corrected all the scientific facts? It's not possible. If you analyze the several stories that are mentioned in the Quran and the Bible, if you analyze closely, there's a difference of chalk and cheese. Bible mentions about the story of Adam, may peace be upon him, that the first man to be created on the earth was Adam. And the Bible gives the date approximately 5,800 years ago. Science today, according to the archaeological evidence and the anthropological evidence, says that the first human being was present tens of thousands of years ago. Quran too speaks about Adam may peace be upon him as the first man, but does not give this unscientific date. Bible speaks about the story of Noah salam. Noah may peace be upon him. That there was a flood. There was a universal flood in Genesis chapter number 6, 7, 8. There was a universal flood in which all living creatures on the earth were submerged and were killed in this flood, except those people that were there in the ark of Nuh. May peace be upon him. The date according to the Bible is approximately in the 21st to 22nd century. Today archaeological evidence shows us that the 11th dynasty of Egypt and the 3rd dynasty of Babylonia existed without any interruption in the continuation in the 21st century BC. Quran 2 speaks about Noah, may peace be upon him, and the flood but does not give a date. And the flood which the Quran speaks about is localized flood. It does not speak about a universal cataclysm. It says that the flood was localized to the people of Noah only, may peace be upon him, which scientists today have got no objection. So you yourself can decipher whether the Quran has been copied or not from the Bible. Thank you. Uh, I would request our speakers uh, who, are, uh, who are questioners who are coming on the mic and those who are sending me slips up, kindly restrain yourself to the topic of the day which is, is the Quran God's word so that uh, we don't have to tell you that this is out of topic. We have received a question on Taslima Nasreen and on justice, uh, women's rights. I would request if the topic is covered like women's rights, we have already got cassette. We would not entertain these topics here. Though Zakir would be able to answer, we would not entertain it here. If you want to know about women rights, you could uh, take the whole cassette, it covers up the whole issue. Those who want to know about Taslima Nasreen, there is a press debate uh, held by the Bombay Union of Journalists in which uh, Dr. Zakir has already 
spoken on Tasreem Manasi in total detail issue where they cross examine him in detail and any topic which is out it may be very important to you it may be important for the other audience also here but if it's uh, not related to the topic of the day it would not be entertained kindly help us by restraining yourself on this issue thank you and may I have your name and occupation before you put forward a question thank you Mr. Bando, my name is Ashok Kishorani I am a member of the R.A. Malik Patrika and I would like to ask the question before I would like to ask the Hafiz Sahib who has given us so much knowledge and I would like to ask him 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 انہوں نے رجنی صاحب کے کہا کہ ہندو ان کو بھگوان مانتے ہیں یہ صرف ان کے شش ہیں تھوڑے بہت تو مانتے ہیں باقی اور ہندو سماج میں آرے سماج میں کوئی بھی نہیں مانتا اس کو بھگوان صرف بول کے بھائد اس کے لئے اس کو اس کو بھید میں صاف لکھا ہے اس کو ستمان سرور نراکہ سرف شکیمہ اجنمہ امر نربہ جتنے بھی قرآن سے اپنے باتیں پتے ہیں خدا کی وہ بالکل اس کے بعد ہم مانتے ہیں اس لئے اس کو خدا نہیں مانتے ہیں سوال میرا یہ ہے قرآن شریف کے تعلیم کے بموجب کیا آپ انسانی حق تسلیم کرتے ہیں کہ انسان خدا کے متعلق دنیا کے اور حادی اور پیغم بے بھی آئے انہوں نے کئی باتیں سنائیں وہ پڑھنے کو آزادی آپ تسلیم کرتے ہیں آپ مدرسے میں ویل شاستر جو آپ بولتے ہیں کہ پہلے بھی آ چکے ہیں پیغم وہ پڑھاتے ہیں وہ چاہتے ہیں کہ وہ بھی سب پڑھیں یہ کمپریٹی اسٹری ہو صرف قرآن شریف نو اور بھی ہو یہ آپ تسلیم کرتے ہیں یا نہیں I would request that the questioners who come up here, we would request them to put their question forward in English because the lecture is in English and the audience here, most of them they have come for a lecture in English. Those, those the speakers may understand the question for a wider appreciation of the people collected here. We would request you to kindly put forward your question in English. We would make this as the first exception. He uh, looks quite elderly, a very knowledgeable person in that context. As a coordinator, I make an exception for the first time. The brother, before posing the question, he said that all the Hindus do not believe in Bhagawan Dajnish. Brother, I never said in my talk that all the Hindus believe in Dajnish. Here, it's been video recorded. You can have the cassette. I said some people believe in Bhagawan Dajnish. So there was a misunderstanding between you and me. I never said that all the Hindus believe. I know what the Hindus believe, even I have studied the scriptures. And the brother posed the question, and he posed a very good question. That do I agree that since the Quran says he has sent several messengers and several revelations, do I believe in the Vedas, do I believe in the Ved Shastra, and do I believe in the other messengers or not? That's the main question. I do agree with him. Quran says in several places. Quran says in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 24, it says, what وَإِمْ مِنْ أُمَّةٍ إِلَّا خِلَافِيَا نَذِيرٍ That there is not a nation to whom we have not sent a warner or a guide. The Quran says in Surah Raad, chapter number 13, verse number 7, وَلِقُلِّ قَوْمٍ حَادٍ And to every nation have we sent a warner. Regarding your question, that do you believe that the way Shastra and do you believe that the other prophets are prophets of God? By name, the Quran mentions 25 prophets by name, Adam, Abraham, Moses, Ismail, Jesus, Muhammad, may peace be upon them all. But according to the tradition, there are more than 1,24,000 prophets sent on the face of the earth. By name, we know in 25. Others, maybe, may not be, we can't say for sure. Regarding a question, that do you consider the Ved to be the word of God? Let's see, are there any common points between the Ved and the Quran? Yes, there are. Since the topic is of God, the Quran too speaks about, I mean the Ved also speaks about God. If you read the Vedas, it's mentioned in the Yurveda, chapter number 3, verse number 32, Na tasya pratima asti, of that God, you cannot make any image. <laughs> the Yurveda Veda says, in chapter number 32, verse number 3, God is formless and bodiless. The same as Yurveda, chapter number 40, verse number 8 says, God has got no image, has got no body. Same as Yurveda. <laughs> chapter number 40, verse number 9 says, that all those who worship the uncreated things, 
there in darkness and it continues andhat mu pavishanti ya sambuti mu paste that you are entering more into darkness if you worship the created things if you worship uncreated things you are in darkness like air water uncreated if you worship the created thing of wood and stone you are more in darkness who says that the yajur veda chapter number 40 verse number 9 it is said in the hindu scriptures ekam braham dusya naste niya naste naste kinchan of that god bhagwan ek hi hai dusra nahi hai zara bhi nahi hai there is only one god not a second one not in the least bit it mentioned the rigveda volume number 8 chapter number 1 verse number 1 march the nadi sansad all praises are due to him alone it's mentioned the rigveda volume number 6 chapter number 45 verse number 16 ya ek it mushti hi there is only one god worship him we believe in it we have got no objection in accepting these portions of vedas they may be the word of god quran is the criteria to judge what is right what is wrong because it is the last and final revelation we muslims have got no objection in accepting all these things of the word of god but there may be other things as i said there may be interpolation which i know of many which i don't want to discuss here it may be there may be interpolation there may be human work which we cannot accept as the word of god as there are unscientific facts in the bible the same also there in the vedas i don't discuss that so we have got no objection that originally vedas may have been the word of god injil the, the quran says injil is the wahi given to isa alay salam it is a revelation given to jesus may peace be upon him so we can say for sure that injil was the word of god but the present bible is an interpolation in the same way i may say that veda may have been the word of god and regarding the messengers yes there are several messengers several regarding ram krishna other messengers what we say may be we can say but we can't say for sure there are some muslims who say that the ram alay salam that's wrong see they're scratching the back i don't have to scratch the back of the hindu so he's scratching my back what i'm saying they may be but even if they are even if ram is the messenger of god almighty even if veda is a scripture of allah subhanahu wa taala as i mentioned they were time bound they were only meant for those people at that time and the message is not eternity quran is the last and final message <laughs> of allah subhanahu wa taala even if if injil even if bible even if veda were the word of god they were for that time not for today quran is the last and final word of god and the last and final messenger prophet muhammad may peace be upon him we have to follow the quran and the prophet hope that answers the question the next question from the lady side my name is mehna sayed and i am a student my question is who created allah the question posed by the sister is who created allah this is the question normally posed by the atheist by the rationalist that remind me of an occasion that once my friend he is a very close friend of mine he had gone to a discussion with the rationalist group of bombay the atheist group and he tried to convince them about the existence of god almighty and he started off saying that this is a cloth who created it where did it come from they said a weaver created it fine it has a creator yes this is a book where did it come from where did the book come from where did the pen come from like that he tried and proved to them that everything has a creator the car it was created in a factory who created the factory maybe the engineer who created the engineer he went on trying and proving everything as a creator and then he asked the question who created the sun who created the moon and while asking these questions 
He said, do you agree everything as a creator? So the rationalist group, they paused and they said, we will agree that everything as a creator only on the condition that you do not change your statement, that you do not go back on your statement. We will agree everything as a creator, but you should not go back on your statement that everything as a creator. My friend was very pleased. He was happy. I have been successful. I have been successful in, con in convincing the atheists. And he poses the next question. Who created the sun? Who created the moon? Everything as a creator. You have to name who was the final creator. I have come from my mother. My mother has come from her mother. Finally, who is the first creator? And he helps them with the answer. The first creator who created everything is God Almighty. In thinking that he had won the discussion. The atheist posed the question. We agree in God Almighty. On the condition, you give us the answer, who created God? And my friend got the shock of his life. He could not answer. He was dumbstuck. He could not sleep the whole night. Next day, he came to me and he told me and he narrated the whole incident to me. And I realized he was using the methodology used by some scholars to prove the existence of God. These scholars, they have missed out a very important rule of logic known as self-analysis. Self-analysis. If you analyze in my talk, never in my talk did I ever say that everything has a creator. Never did I say that. If I would have said that, I would have been trapped. In fact, I was the person who asked the atheist. And the atheist gave the reply that the first person who will know the mechanism is the creator, the manufacturer. I didn't say that. He said it. If suppose someone poses the same question to me. Brother Zakir, who will be the person to tell the mechanism of an unknown object? I will tell him that everything which has a beginning, everything which is created, the first person who will be able to tell the mechanism of such things is the creator. I am using my logic. I don't want to get trapped again. If I say this answer, that the first person will be the person, the first person who will be able to tell the mechanism of anything which is created, which has a beginning, is the creator, you can use that same argument and still prove that the Quran is the word of God. The final answer will be, because science tells us, the sun has a beginning, the moon has a beginning, our universe has a beginning. Who will tell the mechanism? The creator, God Almighty. You ask me the question, who created Allah? It is somewhat similar to a question posed to me by my friend. He said that my brother Tom, he was admitted to the hospital and he conceived and gave birth to a child. Can you tell me, was the child a girl or a boy? I know as a doctor that a male cannot conceive and give birth to a child. The quality of a male is it cannot conceive and give birth to a child. It's an absurd question. Same way, the definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Allah is uncreated. He does not have a beginning. So if you ask me the question, who created Allah, it is as absurd as my friend asking me that, that my brother Tom gave birth to a child, is it a male or a female? Hope that answers the question. Uh, my name is Muhammad Ashraf. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm a student, my question is, uh, uh, many Orientalists uh, claim or rather allege that uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, wrote the Quran for the moral uh, reformation of the Arabs and uh, attributed it to God for better acceptability. The brother has posed the question, and I do agree with him, that some of the Orientalists have said that the beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, he told a lie, Nauz Billah, by saying the Quran is the word of God, so that he could reform the Arabs. I do agree that the message of the Quran and the intention of Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, 
was not only to reform Arabia. The intention of the Quran and our beloved Prophet was to reform the whole world, not only Arabia. If you say, let's analyze this claim. If his main reason was only to reform Arabia, then why should a person use immoral means to make a moral society? Imagine, you want to make a moral society, but you, you yourself start by telling a lie. This can only be done by people who are fake, who do it for money. Openly they may say, we want to reform the world, but inwardly they want money. And I've already disproved that the Prophet did not do it for money. So if the final end result is truth, even the means should be truthful. It's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 93, that who can be more wicked than a person who invents a lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and says that I have received an inspiration when no inspiration has come to him. Or says that I can invent a revelation the same as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the Prophet had actually lied, he would have never mentioned in his own book that the person who lies is a wicked person. In some point of his life, maybe his lie would be exposed when he would be calling himself as a wicked person. And the verse continues to give a humiliating punishment. Again it's mentioned today al haqqa chapter number 69, verse number 44 and 47, that if the messenger was to invent a lie in our name, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we would seize him by his hand. We would seize him by his right hand and cut off the artery of his heart. And you will not be able to save him from our wrath. Even the messenger is not excused. If any messenger was to invent a lie, let it be even Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him. Now, Billah, will never do it. Even if any messenger invents a lie, the Quran says, we will cut off the artery of his heart. There were chances that if the Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, would have lied, surely he would have been exposed in some point of life. And he would be calling, he would bring other people to put him to death. A similar punishment is mentioned in Surah al shuara chapter number 42, verse number 24, as well as in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 105. And there are several instances in which the Prophet himself was corrected in the Quran. If the Prophet wrote the Quran for moral reformation, no, Billah, surely he would not have mentioned those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not like the Prophet doing. For example, one such verse, one such surah, the surah Abasa, chapter number 80. It says that, O Prophet, when the blind man came interrupting, when the blind man came interrupting, he frowned and turned away. What does thou know, lest he may increase in spiritual guidance or receive admonition? This surah was revealed when a blind man by the name of Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum interrupted the Prophet when he was having a discussion with the pagan Arab, the non-Muslims. And the Prophet did not appreciate interruption because when he's speaking with the non-Muslim chief, why should a blind Muslim come interrupt? If it would have been anyone else besides the Prophet, there would be a saint or a sinner, no one would have objected. But because the Prophet, whose character was so noble, it was so high, whose heart always wept for the poor and the needy, for him, a revelation came down. And whenever the Prophet met this person, he always thanked him that because of you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had remembered me. Several such reproofs have been given in the Quran. For example, in Surah Tahrim, chapter number 66, verse number 1. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16. Verse number 126 in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 67. In Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 84, in several places. If the Prophet would have written the Quran for moral reformation, he would not have incorporated this in the Quran. Hope that answers the question.
Assalamu alaikum brother, um, I am a medical student. Brother, in your lecture you spoke about several scientific facts. Are there any facts relating to mathematics in the Quran? Please clarify. The sister posed the question that I have mentioned several scientific facts. Are there any mathematical facts mentioned in the Quran or does this Quran speak anything about mathematics? Yes, the Quran speaks about several things about mathematics. One such law of mathematics which the whole mathematics is actually based on the law of Aristotle, the excluded middle. It says that every proposition, every statement can either be true or false. And for years everyone followed this law. A hundred years ago, there was a person who said, who posed the question, that if ev every statement, every proposition can either be true or false, even this is a statement, even this can be false, what if this is false? The whole mathematics was going to collapse. And all the mathematicians got together and they took out a new consensus, new theory saying that whenever anyone utilizes a word, it can either be used. When you use a word, you talk about its meaning, not the word. But when you mention the word, you talk about the word, not the meaning. Let me give you an example. That if I say that Akbar, Akbar is small. Meaning-wise, it's right. He's a small boy. Akbar is small, no problem. But a person who knows Arabic, he may take objection. Akbar is not small. Akbar means great. See, here I was mentioning the word. I was not using the word. Let me give you another example. Let's suppose, if I say, three always comes before four. No one will have any objection. Three always comes before four. But a skeptic, he will tell me, no, three comes after four in a dictionary. Because T comes after F. You think objection that my statement, three comes before four is wrong. In the dictionary, three comes after four. Because T comes after F. Now when I was saying three comes before four, I was talking about the meaning. I was not talking about the mentioning. The skeptic who is taking an objection is talking about the mentioning, not the meaning. So when a word is utilized, it can be utilized in two ways, either meaning or mentioning. During my talk, I quote a verse of the Quran, of Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 82, which says, Afala is the barun al qurana that do not they consider the Quran with care. Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many contradictions. Meaning wise, it's absolutely clear. No one has been able to take out a single contradiction. The Quran is the word of God. But there's a skeptic who says that I can take out a contradiction. He says, where? So he says, open chapter number 4, verse number 82. The word contradiction is there. The word ikhtilaf is there in the Quran. Quran is proved wrong. The word ikhtilaf is there in the Quran. Is the author tripping itself? I said, wait. Read the full verse. It says, do not they consider the Quran with care. Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many contradictions. And the ikhtilafun kasira, the word ikhtilaf, the word contradiction in the full Quran, occurs only once. So yet, even mentioning wise, the Quran does not trip itself. It is safe. The word ikhtilaf is only mentioned once, and the Quran says, ikhtilafun kasira, many contradictions. We are safe. Another skeptic will come forward and say, okay, I agree, ikhtilaf is only once. But, Quran says, do not they consider the Quran with care. Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many contradictions. The word many contradictions is there. The word ikhtilafun kasira is there. So, Quran is not from God. I know it's a bit difficult to understand, but I will give you a simpler example later on. It's a bit difficult to understand. The vice versa is not always true. When the Quran says that if the Quran would not, do not consider the Quran with care, had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been contradiction. 
the Quran does not say that if there are many contradictions, the, the Quran would have not been from Allah. If the Quran would have mentioned that if there were many contradictions, this book is not from Allah, then the Quran would have been proved wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses words. Because the vice versa need not always be true. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose if I say that all the, all the people living in Bombay, all the Bombayites, they are Indians. It's a true statement. But the vice versa need not be true. All Indians don't stay in Bombay. Some may stay, some may not. So the rule says, the vice versa is not always true. So when Quran says, do not they consider the Quran with care, had it been from anyone besides Allah, it, there would have been many contradictions. So if there are contradictions, it can be from Allah, it cannot be from Allah also. So the Quran does not trip itself. Let me give you a simple example. It mentions Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 1, that the true believers are humble in prayers. Now someone will tell me, I know a Muslim who prays five times a day, but he robs, he cheats. There are black sheep in every community. See, the Quran is wrong. Quran says, true believers are humble in prayer. So I say, wait, listen to the words of the Quran. Quran says, true believers are humble in prayer. Quran does not say, all those who are humble in prayer are true believers. If the Quran would have said, all those who are humble in prayer are true believers, Quran would have been proved wrong. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the best mathematician. He knows, there are skeptics who are going to take out fault in the Quran. He chooses the word. I like to give one more example. That the Quran mentions for Imran chapter number 3, verse number 59, that the similitude of Jesus in front of Allah is the same as Adam may peace be upon them. He was created from dust and said, be and it was. Meaning wise, we have no objection. Jesus Christ may peace be upon him, Adam may peace be upon him, both were created from dust. Meaning wise, it is absolutely clear. But, if you count in the Quran, the word Isa alayhi salam, Isa may peace be upon him, Jesus may peace be upon him, is mentioned 25 times in the full Quran. And if you count, Adam may peace be upon him, even he is mentioned 25 times. So, besides the meaning being same, even the mentioning is same. There are several such examples. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 176, it says that oh, as to those who reject our signs, they are like dogs. The Arabic statement, as to those who reject our signs, is mentioned in the Quran five times. The Arabic word for dog is kalb. Even that is mentioned five times. Besides the meaning being same, even the mentioning is same. Surah Fatih chapter number 35, verse number 20 says that the darkness is not like light. Arabic word for darkness is zulumat. It is mentioned 23 times in the Quran. The word for light, Arabic word, is nur. It is mentioned 24 times in the Quran. So even Besides the meaning being correct, even the mentioning matches that darkness is not like night. 23 is not like 24. So wherever Quran says this is like that, besides the meaning being same, even the mentioning is same. If the Quran says this is not like that, besides the meaning matching, even the mentioning will not match. And besides this, the Quran is coded so well. It's impossible to make the Quran, even by a computer, the example I gave you of Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 59, he says, The similitude of Jesus, may peace be upon him, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is like Adam, may peace be upon him. He was created from dust, and being it was. Besides both being mentioned 25 times, if you start counting from Surah Fatiha, chapter number 1, verse number 1, till Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 59, Adam alayhi salam is mentioned the seventh time. Even Isa alayhi salam, from the beginning, till Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 59, is mentioned seventh time. So if anyone wants to change the order also, they will not be able to change the order. There are several other mathematical facts, but since it's a question answer time, I will not be able to throw more light on that. Next. The next question, please. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Riyaz Dave. I am a municipal contractor by profession. My question to you is, there are 
99 names of Allah, out of which Razik is one of the names. Allah is Razik sustainer. What sometimes crops up in my mind is then why do people in Ethiopia and Somalia die of hunger? That's my question. The brothers posed the question that one of the attributes, one of the 99 attributes mentioned in the Quran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Razik. Then why do people in Ethiopia die of hunger? First, I'd like to remind you, brother, that Allah has got more than 99 attributes in the Quran. Though I know you find people saying 99 attributes, I mean, I said that. But there are more than 99 attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But people, for their own reasons, they pick out 99. One author may pick out a particular 99, the other author may pick up some, some other 99 when he writes a book. But there are more than 99 attributes given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. And I do agree, one of those attributes is Razik, means one who gives sustenance. The question posed by the brother is, then why do people in Ethiopia die of hunger? Why do children die of hunger? Why do people who are adults die of hunger? The Quran rightly says, that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gives risk, who sustains everyone. But at the same time, Quran says that we inflict with you, you, we inflict the human beings with a test of wealth, with certain calamities like famine. We test you with certain calamities like flood to know which of you is a true believer. Allah can give everyone. He tests you that if I abstain you from little bit food, do you still believe in him? If I give you a little bit of poverty, do you still believe in him? Allah tests. Because Quran says in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, that this life that you lead is a test for the year after. This life that you lead is a test for the year after. So there are different examinations for each one. Everyone can't have the same examination. You and I are lucky brother. We have got food. But Allah is testing us in some other way. Allah gives you wealth and sees whether you spend it in the way of Allah or not. Allah is not testing you with food. We tested some people with food, some people with wealth, some people with children, some people with spouses, different tests. Whenever you give an examination, you can't say that the examiner should give the same test to everyone. But, irrespective, whatever the test is, the judgment should be just. Quran says, Malik Ramadin, he is the master of the day of judgment. Depending upon which test we give you, he judges that way. Suppose you are running a race and a person is lame. You know you have a handicap, so you give him in a 100 meters dash, you give him a 50 meters lead. And a person who has both the legs, he starts from first. So that both have equal opportunity. So depending upon the test Allah has given you, he will judge you on the basis of that. Hope that answers the question. Assalamualaikum. I'm uh, Kashmira Nagda. I'm a revert Muslim. I'm a student of Final CA. My question is actually uh, in the first part of your lecture, you said there are no contradictions in the Quran. Okay, but uh, there is a ayah in the Quran which uh, the number I'm not aware of. But uh, Allah says in the Quran that He seals the heart of certain people and hence they do not understand. But we all know that it is the brain that thinks and the mind. Can we clarify that? The sister has asked a very good question and I'd like to congratulate her too thrice for reverting into Islam. She says, she said that Allah says in certain parts of the Quran, and I do agree with her, that Allah seals the heart, mohar lagai, on the heart. And so that people who don't come close to the truth, they have been sealed. She asked the question that today science is advanced and we know that brain is the main organ required for thinking, not the heart. Previously people thought it was the heart. So isn't there an error in the Quran? If you realize, in the beginning of my talk, I also quoted a verse of the Quran, the third quotation, verse from Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 25-28, which says, Rabbi Shohali Sadri, Sadri, Oh my Lord, increase my breath for me. Rabbi Shohali Sadri, Vayasrili Amri, Wahlul Ugdata Millesani Yafka Kauli, increase my breath for me and make my 
task easy for me and remove the impediment from my speech so that they will understand. Now hear the word again, father, heart. So why should Allah increase my heart? The Arabic word father have got two meanings. One is heart and the other is center. If you go to Karachi, you will find southern so and so, southern so and so, center so and so. So father in Arabic, besides meaning heart, also means center. So here Quran says that we have sealed your centers, brain. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbi shawhali sadri, O my Lord, increase my center, intellect, and remove the impediment between me and the audience. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Khalid. Dr. Sakir, is it not contradictory that the Quran calls Iblis an angel in one place and a jinn at another place? So, that poses the question that doesn't the Quran contain a contradiction when it says that in several places Iblis was an angel, but one place it says that you are the jinn. The Quran mentioned about the story of Iblis and Adam may peace be upon him in several places in the Quran. It's mentioned in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, in Surah Araf chapter number 7, in Surah Hijjah chapter number 15, in Surah Isra chapter number 17, in Surah Kahab chapter number 18, in Surah Taha chapter number 20, in Surah Saw chapter number 38, several places. And in all these places, I do agree that the Quran says, we have said to the angels, bow down. All of them bow down except Iblis. This is the English translation. We said to the angels, bow down, all bow down except Iblis. But one place in the Quran, the brother did not give the reference. He was referring to Surah Qaf, chapter number 18, verse number 50, which says, we said to the angels, bow down, all bow down except Iblis. Iblis was among the jinn. So if you analyze, seven places the Quran says, Iblis was an angel. One place it says, Iblis was a jinn. Isn't there a contradiction? This is the English translation of the Holy Quran. But the Quran was revealed in Arabic. And in Arabic language, there is a grammar known as Taglib. Arabic grammar known as Taglib, in which if the majority is addressed, if you address to a majority, even the minority is included. I'll just give an example. If I suppose there are 100 students in the class, out of which 99 students are boys and one is a girl, and if I say in Arabic, all boys stand up, even that girl will stand up because she knows the rule of Taglib. But if I say in English, all boys stand up, only the 99 boys will stand up, the girl will not stand up. So the Quran was revealed in Arabic. And when the Quran says, we said to the angels, bow down, all bowed down except Iblis, it shows that the majority of the people that were there were angels. Iblis may be an angel, may not be an angel. But Surah Qahaf chapter number 18 verse number 50 says that he was a jinn. So Quran says in Surah Qahaf chapter number 18 verse number 50 that he was a jinn. And the other places it says maybe he was an angel or not an angel. We have to agree with Surah Qahaf chapter number 18 verse number 50. It's not a contradiction. You have to apply the rule of Arabic grammar Taglib. And secondly, the angels don't have a free will of their own. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa says, they immediately obey. Jinns have a free will. So this is the second proof that they believe for the jinn. I hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. Now we believe that God is supernatural and He can do everything. A non-Muslim friend of mine has a question, why is it that God does not assume a human form? Can you please explain? The sister posed the question that God is supernatural, He can do everything, and her friend posed the question, then why can't God Almighty take human forms? The people who believe in God, they say that God is supernatural. Everyone out here who believes in God will also believe that God is supernatural. I would like to know which person out here who believes in a God says that God is not supernatural. 
Everyone. Everyone who believes in God, they believe that God is supernatural. Supernatural means there is nature and then there is God. In fact, according to the Quran, God is not supernatural. God is not supernatural. According to the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, God created nature. It will never be that nature said this and God is saying the opposite. God created the nature. God created a fitra, the innate nature in the human being. One of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given in the Quran is Fatir, which is the name of the 35th surah of the Quran. Fatir has been derived from the word fitra, meaning innate nature. Fatir means the creator, the originator of creation, the creator of the primeval matter to which more creation is added by God Almighty. Therefore, when we break our fast in Ramzan, we say iftar. Iftar means break. Same way, the word Fatir means creator. It means shaper, former as well as splitter. Quran tells the people that don't you see the, eye, the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't you ponder on them? Look at the sun, look at the moon. They are following the laws of nature. They will never change their course. They are all natural. Same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is too natural. It's mentioned in the Quran. In Surah Ahzab, chapter number 33, verse number 62, it says, Walan Tajid, Walan Tajid, that the nature, Walan Tajid, Nisunatillah, Tabdila, that you will never find a change in the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah Ahzab, Chapter number 33, verse number 62. A similar message is repeated in the Quran saying that establish the handiwork of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never will you find a change in the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a standard religion, but most of them will not understand. Mentioned through a room, chapter number 30, verse number 30. Today science tells us the quantum and the modern science they tell us that without an observer you don't have anything. The universe without the observer is useless. The scientists pose the question, who was the first observer? Another attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a shaheed the witness. Quran says Allah was the person who first witnessed. So God is not supernatural, God is natural. Regarding the second part of the question, that God can do everything. Normally, I pose this question to most of the people who believe in God, just so that they have a better understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask them the question, that can God create anything and everything? Most of them will say yes. Can God destroy anything and everything? All will say yes. My third question is, can God create a thing? which he cannot destroy, and they are trapped. If they say yes, that God can create a thing which, which he cannot destroy, they are going against the second statement that God can destroy everything. If they say no, God cannot create a thing which he cannot destroy, that means they are going against the first statement that God can create everything. Again, they are not using the logic. They are trapped. Same way, God cannot create a tall short man. Yes, he can make a tall man short, but no longer he remains tall. He can make a tall man short, no longer he remains tall. He can make a short man tall, no longer that man remains short. But you can't have a tall short man. You can have a medium man, who is neither tall neither short. But God can't make a man who is tall and short at the same time. Similarly, God Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, cannot make a fat thin man. There are a thousand things I can list which God Almighty can't do. 
God cannot tell a lie. The moment he tells a lie, he ceases to be God. God cannot be unjust. The moment he is unjust, he ceases to be God. God cannot be cruel. God cannot forget. You can list a thousand things. God Almighty cannot throw me out of his domain. The full world, the full universe belongs to him. He can kill me. He can obliterate me. He can make me vanish. But he cannot throw me out of his domain. To him belongs everything. Where will he throw me? He can kill me, he can obliterate me, he can make me vanish, but he can't throw me out of his domain. Nowhere does the Quran say, God can do everything. In fact, Quran says, In Allah ala kulli shay'in kadir, that verily Allah has power over all things. Quran does not say God can do everything. Quran says, God has power over all things. Several places. Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 106. Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 108. Surah Imran, Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 29. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 77. In Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 1. Several places the Quran says, In Allah ala kulli shay'in kadir. Verily, Allah has power over all things. And there's a world of a difference between Allah can do everything and Allah has power over everything. In fact, Quran says in Surah Buruj, chapter number 85. Verse number 15 and 16, it says that Allah is the doer of all he intends. See, whatever he intends he can do. But God only does godly things. He does not do ungodly things. Regarding the main question, why can't God take human form? Posed by a non-Muslim. This philosophy of God taking forms is called as anthropomorphism. That God Almighty takes form, and they have a beautiful logic. That for God Almighty to say, to know, to instruct the people, how it feels when a person is hurt, he had to take a form of a human being. To, to tell to the mankind how it feels when you are hurt, how it feels when you are happy, how it feels when you are sad, to lay down the do's and don'ts for the human being, God Almighty took the form of human being, known as the theory of anthropomorphism. But if you analyze, this logic does not stand the test. Suppose I create, I am the inventor of a tape recorder. I create television. I don't have to become a tape recorder to know what is good and bad for the tape recorder. I don't have to become a television to know what is good or bad for the television. I just write a catalog that to play a cassette, insert the cassette, press the button play, the cassette will start playing. Press stop, it will stop. Press fast forward, it will fast forward. I put down a catalog. Same way, God need not become a human being to know what is good or bad for the human being. He chooses a man amongst men to give the instruction, to give the catalog. Which is the catalog? The Quran. The catalog for the human being the do's and don'ts, what is good for them, what is bad for them, is the Qur'an. He does not have to become a human being. Why? You ask me, can God take human form? Yes, he can take. But the moment he takes the human form, he ceases to be God. Because God is immortal. Human beings are mortal. You can't have an immortal and mortal person at the same time. It's like a tall short man. Human beings, they have certain qualities, they have bonds, for example, they have to eat, they have to eat. Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 14, Say, will I take for anyone as a protector besides Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who feeds everyone but is not required to be fed? Human beings required to eat? God requires to eat? No. Human beings requires to sleep. It mentioned in the Quran, in chapter number 2, Verse number 255 in the Ayatul Kursi. No slumber can seize him, no sleep. God does not require to sleep. So if you have a man, man requires to sleep, man requires to rest, man requires to eat, how can God come down and be mortal and immortal at the same time? It's illogical. If you say that God takes human forms 
and has human qualities, you are giving a whip to the atheist to beat you with. The moment you say God is supernatural, God can do everything, you are giving a whip to the atheist to beat you with. God is not supernatural, God cannot do everything, God cannot take human forms, God is natural. God has power over everything. He is the doer of all he intends and he does not take human form. Uh, my name is Austin Phillips. Uh, I am a Christian. Now there are many questions I would like to ask but I know time will not permit. So, uh, most, uh, can we have the most important question put? Yeah, the most important question now I will ask is uh, what, I com what comes to my mind right now is this that, the, that Islam uh, speaks about Jesus Christ. Islam uh, believes that Jesus Christ was, it doesn't believe that he died on the cross and he rose again from the dead, but it believes that he was raised up, Jesus was raised up uh, by God. It, uh, it, does, it also says that Muhammad was not raised up. I think I'm right. Somebody told me this. Muhammad was not raised up. Jesus was raised up. And one Muslim friend also told me that Islam believes that Jesus was born of a virgin and he was born by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he was not born in the natural way. Now this proves that Jesus Christ, if he's not God, at least he's greater than Muhammad. Now why, why don't you consider, if you have the teachings of Muhammad, why don't you give the teachings of Jesus also which are there in the Bible? Uh, can I put another question associated with that? <laughs> uh, it's from Harold Porter. He also asked, if you say that God is one, then how did Jesus Christ come into the picture? The brother asked a very good question. And these questions are mainly posed by the missionaries, Christian missionaries. I don't know whether he's one. And he gave some two, three examples that Islam speaks about Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him. And he says, that the Quran says that Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him, was raised up alive. Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, was not. Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him, was born of a virgin birth. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a mother and father. Who's greater? Your mind gives the answer. Who's greater? Jesus. And then he says, and there are many such questions. It also says, it says, that Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him, is mentioned 25 times. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, only five times by name. Who's greater? And the post questions. The post questions are the Muslims. And our mind thinks, ah, who's greater? Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him. So he wants me to throw some light on Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him. Brothers, Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus, may peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus, may peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians do not believe. We believe. We believe that he gave life to the death with God's permission. We believe he healed those born and dying with God's permission. But there are parting of ways. We don't believe that he's God Almighty. We don't believe that he's the begotten Son of God. We believe he is the messenger of God. Coming to your question, if the Quran mentions that Jesus Christ may peace be upon him, was raised up alive, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi died. Who's greater? Doesn't it indicate that if there is someone after God, it has to be who? If someone has to slaughter someone, if someone has to sacrifice, you have to sacrifice the best person. And according to them, the best person is Jesus Christ may peace be upon him. According to the Quran, he was not crucified. They killed him not, you did crucify him. We agree. But according to your Bible, according to, your, according to the false reading, the Bible also says he was not crucified, that the Jews crucified. Most of the people did not accept him to be a messenger of God Almighty. They went to extreme. Quran says, La taqlufi dinukum. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 171, it says that, Ya Ahl kitab O people of the book, La taqlufi dinukum, do not go to extreme in your religion. What extreme? Two extreme. Jews said, he was an imposter, and the Christian said, that he was God Almighty. Extreme. Speak not of God, or but the truth. Well, speak the truth. There's only one God. He was raised up because there was misconception. In a second coming, he will not teach us anything new. 
Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 3, On this day have I perfected a religion for you, and have chosen for you Islam as a way of life. <laughs> we Muslims, we believe will come, but he will not teach us anything new. He will not teach us anything new. He will come to clarify the misconception. And he, and he will tell to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah bari ta'ala, you be my witness that I never told them to worship me. I never told them to call me the begotten son. He will come for the Christian, not for the Muslim. We believe he will come. You say that he was born of virgin birth. If suppose, if suppose a person does not have a father and you claim because he does not have a father, he is God Almighty, Quran gives the answer in Surah Imran, Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 59. Similitude of Jesus in front of Allah is the same as Adam. They were created from dust and say, be it was. Adam may peace be upon him. Did he have a father? Adam may peace be upon him. He had no father. He had no mother. If you say a person does not have a father is God Almighty, Adam may peace be upon him is a bigger God. <laughs> Your Bible. It's, it's, it's not the Quran, it's the Bible. Bible speaks about another superhuman. King Melchizedek. King Melchizedek. He had no ascent, no descent, no beginning, no end. He is bigger than even Adam, may peace be upon him. See, the Quran gives the answer. Quran gives the answer. You say Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him, is mentioned by name 25 times. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa only five times. Why? Because there were allegations against Jesus, may peace be upon him. There were no allegations against Muhammad, may peace be upon him. And when the Quran was revealed, Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, was present. So if I have to address a person, I have to say he, the, O Nabi, O Prophet, I need not take his name always. But if I am referring to my friend who is not here, I have to take his name. That Mr. X, Y, Z. So since Jesus, may peace be upon him, was not there when the Quran was revealed, his name had to be taken. In that, in that way, Quran mentions the name of Musa alayhi salam one thirty two times. Does it mean he is greater than Prophet Muhammad and Isa alayhi salam both? No. Because they were not present, when any example is given of them, their name has to be taken. For a person who is present, the, the name need not be taken. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, we would like you to note that we would have the Zuhar prayers after the program in Jamaat. You could join Dr. Zakir, all of us, those who would like to have Jamaat. We'll, maybe we'll have a bigger Jamaat if you'll cooperate outside in the mosque. The next question uh, from the lady said, now we will start a session. I think there are more, uh, much more quantity of uh, brothers here than the sisters. We would have, uh, now I would change the system, let the ladies be asking a question, then a uh, gent here in a clockwise fashion, then again another brother will ask a question here again to the ladies. One chance to the ladies, two chance to the gents, so that we balance the number of people waiting. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Zakir. My name is Ishra Ansari and I'm a science graduate presently doing my MA in Islamic studies. My question to you is, uh, in the Quran it has been mentioned that no one besides God knows the sex of the child in the mother's womb. However, modern sciences have developed certain tests by which you can determine the sex of the child in the mother's womb. Is this not a discrepancy in the Quran? Wa alaikum salam sister. She has posed the question that the Quran mentions that no one besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the sex of the child in the womb. And today I do agree with her that there are many medical tests, for example, amniocentesis, ultrasonography, which can determine the sex of the child. So isn't there a mistake, a scientific error in the Quran? What the sister is referring to is referring to the verse of the Quran from Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 34, which says, only Allah knows the hour, that is the day of judgment. No one besides Allah knows the day of judgment. When will it rain? What is in the womb of the mother? What will a person earn? And where will he die? These five things, no one besides Allah SWT knows. Our main question is, that Quran says, that no one besides Allah knows the sex of the child in the womb. Sister, the misconception is because there are a few translations. There are a few translations, especially the Urdu translations, which have mentioned that no one besides Allah knows the sex of the child in the womb. In the Arabic text, the sex is not mentioned. The Quran says, no one besides Allah knows 
what is in the womb. The Quran does not refer your to sex, it refers to how will the child be. Will he be honest? Will he be dishonest? Will he be a boon for the society? Will he be a bane for society? What will he become? Will he become an engineer? Will he become a doctor? And believe me, with all your medical scientific knowledge, you can never tell in advance what will a person be. That is a mistranslation. Before the next question comes. That's a very good question. He said that it, it can't... Please don't interrupt, brother. What you want to say can come in the mic, brother. It is better if you come in the mic and say. Still I give him a chance. Maybe the non-Muslim, no problem. He is saying maybe I am misleading. If there is a difficulty in understanding the language, go to the lexicon, the Arabic lexicon. There are Arabic lexicon written by non-Muslim and the best one is Lane's lexicon. <laughs> go to the Lane's lexicon written by non-Muslim and they will tell you the sex is not there in the Arabic text. They will tell you, not I. <laughs> Regarding other criteria, what about day of judgment? There are people who predicted. It had come in times of India that in November 1992, there was a Korean church which said that the world is going to end in November 1992. All the people who followed that church came there. Nothing happened. We are yet living. And the people ran away with the money. No one knows when the world is going to end. Regarding rain, some people will say, science will develop. By weather forecast bureau, you can say where it's going to rain. When it's going to rain. You know how, how accurate the rains are. How accurate the weather forecast bureaus are, especially in India. Okay, some may say, America, America, they are perfect. Okay, for sake of argument, agree. Give them rope to hang themselves. The Weather Forecast Bureau, when they tell you when and how much is going to rain, they tell you on the basis of looking at the clouds and analyzing what is the speed of wind, when it will fall. It's nothing great. The rain is already present in the cloud. It is like you telling me, uh, suppose a person sits for an examination and the results are going to be out after one month. And the teacher corrects the patient, the teacher corrects the paper after three weeks. And she knows in advance that this person came out first. This person got 93 marks. Just because she knows in advance. It's nothing great. She already corrected the paper. So just because before putting on the notice board, if she says one week in advance, who came out first, it's nothing great. The rain is already present in the cloud. The great part will be if the Weather Forecast Bureau can tell today when and where is it going to rain exactly 200 years afterwards without looking at the clouds? I challenge any, any weather forecast bureau to say in advance, 200 years in advance, where, which part of the world exactly how much is going to rain. They will never be able to do it. Regarding where will a person die? Some people can say yes. See, I will commit suicide, I will die here. Most of the cases of people who commit suicide, they fail. Majority. How many people want to commit suicide? Hardly, just a negligible amount. And those majority of the people who try to commit suicide, majority are unsuccessful. After they take poison, they go and tell somebody else. Then they rush to the hospital. When they jump, they see where there's a safe landing. And even if you jump, if Allah wants to save you, He can save you. If you die, it's with His permission, not without His permission. <laughs> Regarding the last point, no one knows how much he's going to earn. You may say, See, Brother Zakir, I know that I earn 2,000 2, rupees a month. See, the Quran is wrong. The Quran does not talk about earning here in money. It talks about taqsib. The word taqsib in Arabic can also mean earning good deeds and bad deeds. It does not only mean salary. And even if you say that I give charity of 100 rupees, you can never know how much, how much sawab you are getting, how much blessing you are getting. You will never know how much blessing you'll get by doing a good act and how much sin, how much negative points you'll get by doing a bad deed. Everything is kept intact in the record of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. And uh, excuse me, now uh, because uh, the management said we have to shorten the program for another 10-15 minutes, uh, just to give a chance to those who have given slips, at least one or two chances I should give when they have sent me such a huge uh, list of slips. I would put one question from the slip, then a question from the brother, 
then again from the slip, then from the uh, other brother, then from the sister and so on, so that uh, we maintain the rules of the auditorium. I would put this... Uh, and the question is, uh, you know that Arun Shauri has written several articles and books against Islam. Why don't you challenge him to a public debate? The person has posed the question that I know Arun Shuri has written several articles and books against Islam. Why don't I challenge him for a debate? And I've read those articles. Most of the articles are mainly based on two points. One is talking about the woman, that the women don't have the equal rights. And secondly, is about that Islam is a terrorist religion. It's a merciless religion. And a few points here and there, like the one the brother mentioned, God does not know match, etc. Let's analyze. Believe me, all of them, as I mentioned, out of context, mistranslation, misquotation. Yes, that's right, brother said that I can clarify it. That's what I'm doing. The brother thing with him. We would like the audience that you have maintained a very good decency, we appreciate that. Please be seated. The question posed was, why don't I challenge Arun Shuri for a debate? If you've written so many books against Islam, if you read the latest book on the world of fatwas, Sharia in action, latest book, it was just released in Bombay just a week ago I think just a few days ago and I was able to read that book and there if you read the back cover on the back cover he has given a beautiful emblem of a certain Arabic quotation of the Quran which is from chapter number 48 Surah Fatah verse number 29 which says Muhammad may peace be upon him is the messenger of Allah and those who follow him are firm and unyielding are un un uncompassionate towards the unbelievers, but have love between the believers. Full stop. Full stop as the no full stop. Again, quoting out of context, giving the impression that Muslims, we are merciless against the unbelievers. He's quoting out of context. If you read the context, it starts from Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 25, which says that these unbelievers were the one who did not agree with the revelation of the Quran and they prevented you from entering the sacred mosque and prevented you from sacrificing the animals and prevented you from reaching the place of sacrifice. These unbelievers prevented the Muslims from performing the pilgrimage. I want to know that suppose any Christian is prevented from entering the Vatican City Will he love that person? Will he embrace him? But natural, he will not like the person. If suppose a Hindu is prevented from entering the place of his pilgrimage, Banaras, will he like it? No. The same way, if you read in context, it says that these people who prevented you from entering Makkah, the sacred mosque, and prevented you from sacrificing the animal, you have to be firm with them and love those people who are the believers. Putting out of context, and in that book, as I told you, if you read on page number 571, and page number 572, he quotes his favorite verse, very favorite, his pet verse of Surah Toba, chapter number 9, verse number 5, which says that after the four, four forbidden months have passed, seize the unbeliever, in bracket, indicating seize the Hindus, seize the unbelievers and slay them. But if they repent and if they give charity, if they pray, let them go. Indicating that every Muslim, whenever he finds a Hindu, slay him, kill him. But if he accepts Islam, let him go. Again, he's quoting out of context. Out of context. The context is from Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 1. 
there was a peace treaty between the pagans of Mecca and the Muslims. This treaty was unilaterally broken by the pagans. So Allah gives a warning. Put things straight in four months or a declaration of war. And during war it says that during war when you, fight, when you find these unbelievers who have broken the peace treaty, seize them and kill them. Suppose the president of America says to the soldiers of American, the American soldiers, that during the war between Vietnam and America, wherever you find a Vietnamese, kill him. It will, if I quote that today and say that the American president said, kill the Vietnamese wherever you find him, it will sound that he's a butcher. I'm quoting out of context. In context but natural, the leader of the army or the president will always say that when the enemy comes, don't get scared, fight. It boosts up the morale. So what is wrong if Quran says that? And then on page number 572, from verse number 5, he jumps to verse number 7, 8, 9. Verse number 6 is skipped. You know why? Verse number 6 gives the answer. It says that if any of these pagans, if any of these mushriks, these unbelievers, if they ask for asylum, give it to them, so that they will hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and escort them to safety. Quran does not say give them asylum. Don't let them go. Quran says escort them to a place of safety. These mushriks, even though they don't accept Islam, if they want asylum, es don't just leave them. Escort them to a place of safety. Which, which army general will say that when the enemy wants, if he wants to leave, escort him to a place of safety. Which army? I want to know which general of any army today will say that if the enemy wants peace, don't leave him, escort him to safety. This is what the Quran says. Quoting out of context, the favorite topic. That Muslims are merciless out of context, all verses out of context. And the second favorite topic. And these verses, similarly, these verses were also quoted by people like Tasneem and Asreen. You ask me, why don't I have a debate with Arun Shuri? I had a debate on the topic of Tasneem and Asreen, organized by the Bombay Union of Journalists, press debate, organized by them. And in that debate, when I told them, I want to video record the debate, the Bombay Union of Journalists did not give me the permission. And you know what was the topic? The topic was, is religious fundamentalism a stumbling block to the freedom of expression? Talking about freedom of expression, but hypocrites, they don't allow me to tape. Bye. I promise them, I promise them, I will give you an unedited copy of that cassette to you. They didn't allow me. After a lot of pressure, finally they allowed it. I know what happened? By the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the people were out at making Islam the scapegoat, making Zakir a scapegoat. With the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah, it was not my genius. It was his help that the debate was a very successful one. So successful, so successful that not a single paper reported. Not a single paper. In that debate, from the Christian side was Father Pereira. From the Hindu side was Dr. Vaid Vyas. From the Islamic side, I was there. And there was Mr. Ashok Shani, who translated the book like Jain to Marathi. The topic was Tasneem and Asreen. If this cassette was not there, who would have known about it? Today, lakhs of people have seen it. Not only in Bombay, throughout the world. Lakhs. If this thing was not recorded, who would have known about it? And the second topic about women, Arun Shuri. All the answers are given in the cassette. There are two parts. Part number one about the lecture and part two, women's rights in Islam, modernizing out the part two. It clarifies most of the misconception that people, including Arun Shuri, have about this. <laughs> Regarding, huh? would I like to have a debate? Is he worth debating? Is he worth debating? He's not worth debating. And if he wishes, he can come for a debate. I am 
all games. Ehlan was Ehlan. Ehlan was Ehlan. But in public. I will debate in public with a live video recording. In public, not just in a closed room. Hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Uh, we are really very sorry. The management is not, has three said no further going on. We have to close down. I thank all those present here, Mr. Rafiq Dada, our distinguished guests here, all of you that have made it a very interesting evening for everyone present here. Inshallah, those who would like to ask questions could come at the Islamic Research Foundation and carry on with this. Every Sunday we have regular programs. You could come to ask your questions. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khair for the program. Thank you. Shukran.